un peu moins, ouais, de 8 minutes à peu près. 8 minutes. Ouais. C'est bon, tout fonctionne correctement Ça fonctionne correctement Parfait, donc on peut commencer. So, I understand we can start. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Alexandre Anjouin, General Delegate uh, of the Electricien Sans Frontières. It's a GMO of uh, Solidarity uh, of Public Utility and we work to give access to electricity uh, and to water too uh, in rural zones where you have uh, populations, uh, unprivileged populations on our planet. So I wanted to, uh, to, to call a uh, panel of uh, persons uh, to talk about the ac universal access to uh, modern energy uh, while fighting against uh, climate change. Uh, well, the thing is that the first thing, um, in, 2000, in 2019, there's still 10% of people who have no access to electricity, which is like uh, 800 million people. You have to remember that in Africa, for example, 50% uh, of the population is only has access to electricity. And among these persons, 95-7% of people li live in rural zones. So a world population that has no access to, uh, to electricity. Second uh, thing, the carbon. When we, uh, when we see the report of uh, GIEC, uh, we're talking about six by the end of the century. So we have uh, an objective of carbon emotion and we remember 80% uh, of the emissions of carbon is the connected with energy. We cannot imagine that the 10% of humans that have no access to electricity tomorrow uh, will have will have access through through uh, the, the same energy, energy mix that we have today. So uh, we'll try to answer these issues with four persons who have uh, the uh, vision of the thing uh, from different levels. From uh, the uh, international energy Agency and the ODF uh, vision of uh, solutions, uh, state and electric, the another, an Electricien Sans Frontières, and uh, an African association that is called Association Africaine pour l'Électrification Rurale, also called Ear Club, that will be shown on the video. You'll see it. So thank you very much that to be here. I would like to thank all the the, uh, uh, the persons who are with us, and I will let you speak about these questions questions that will appear as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Okay, my name is Sam Ali from the uh, International Agency for Energy. If you don't know us, we are an international intergovernmental organization based in Paris who uh, works uh, together with uh, different countries in the world for a good uh, uh, energy transition that would be just, fair, and uh, affordable in time, that will last in time. So how to conserve ac uh, universal access uh, to, uh, to energy, uh, to this, uh, how to conserve it with the fight against the climate change, I will uh, talk to you about some works from our colleagues, from my colleagues. A uh, short answer would be, this is something that is possible and we believe it. So I will just show you a few uh, figures, really on the emissions of um, uh, gases, greenhouse gases. We see the trajectory. There will be no fundamental change in our uh, energy systems. These emissions will uh, increase. Uh, CO2 emissions coming from energy generation on the back steps. This is a scenario uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, policies that are in place tomorrow, today, and that will be there tomorrow, and will be the, the, the impact of the uh, emissions if we implement these policies. So we see that for now, there are emissions that will uh, increase, especially in the emerging countries and the developing countries, and these emissions will increase uh, by 5 billion tons of CO2. The other other futures that would be possible. You know, there's a scenario where the system, energetic system at the global level uh, will get to the uh, zero emission in 2050. It's the NZE uh, 
scenario. So you can see that here there is a, there's a decrease of emissions everywhere. Of course, uh, most of the emissions come from the emerging countries and the developing countries. That's absolutely normal. And a, gr gr and a big de decrease of emissions in developed countries. Next, what you see about the axis is that uh, basing of what is uh, forecasted today, even with lots of effort that is being uh, put in place, we will not attain the, uh, the sustainable objective of access of energy. But in the other scenario, with no emissions, CO2, uh, 2050, it's possible. So this is a scenario in which these two objectives are connected, are connected, interconnected, and then are accomplished together. So this is really a fundamental, fundamental path. Because giving access to energy has a very slow, low impact of the glo on global emissions. We're talking about people who have emissions by uh, per capita that are very low. Other consumptions of energy, and we'll want to uh, access to the energy, and will have an impact on uh, the emission. And everything that will be uh, uh, clean cooking will have a, a very good. Uh, impact on the emission of uh, greenhouse gases. So now if we uh, see even with, uh, with big investments, even if we have uh, the CO2 may increase, but there's a lot, lots of programs that may use uh, the liquid gas as uh, a way to, uh, to have less emissions in clean cooking. It replaces in, in lots of cases uh, equipment that are very not efficient and they, then that uh, burn traditional biomass, which produces lots of other emissions, uh, methane and uh, nitrate. We can have a, a positive impact if we work the way we have to, without uh, talking about the impact on deforestation on, on the black on black coal. Uh, and if we will look at the electricity, the demand on uh, additional electricity with a universal uh, access to university, which is 63 terawatt hours, is neglected in the context in the scenario where the countries are trying to, uh, to get into transition. We're talking about uh, producing cleaner energy. There's more production of electricity, and then it's a really uh, uh, negligible impact. What is important is to know that now, in the two last years, we had a negative uh, impact on the access with the uh, with the COVID crisis, and you can see uh, an increase in uh, uh, in the progress that we had seen in the previous years in the access in electricity and clean cooking. The, the tendency have been reversed. I'm going further because don't have. We are going to talk about Africa, and we've seen that. Uh, uh, at the, at the world level, we have an, uh, an increase of 1%. In the sub-Saharan Africa, it's 4% compared to 2019. We're talking about people who have no access. And it's really a question of uh, economic impact, lots of uh, programs, because lots of uh, public services that had no means to follow the, the, the programs. In Asia, that was different because it's a population that uh, that had access to energy since uh, recently, but that has lost it because the, um, the income of the um, households has have decreased. And of course, poor people are a problem too for the same reasons, and we, there's no uh, change in this trajectory. So this being said, uh, we're talking about investments. It's quite the country here we're in the moment in which we should have mo much more investments uh, on, in uh, access to energy. So this investment was uh, decreasing the last two years, and uh, the progress have been lost. If we see the different difference between the investments in a scenario in which we have access, universal access, uh, compared to where it's uh, unexistent in, in the coming years, it, this is something that means four times what we see here. That means that we're talking about 2% of the uh, global investments in energy. So it's not a figure uh, that's impossible uh, to, uh, to be implemented. It's not uh, undoable. When you see the impact that it has on the uh, health uh, and activity of this population, population is very important. And uh, we put a great emphasis on that, uh, especially when you, when you have a reversal of, re reverse of the progress. If we see the, the programs to, uh, to close the, the loop uh, between the compatibility with the light uh, against um, 
climate changes. We can see uh, we're talking about 80% 80 80 of persons that would have access in the uh, zero emission scenario uh, would be from the renewable energy. So when we spoke about populations, rural populations, basically, as said by Alexandre, there's a lot of uh, access by independent system and many uh, networks. That's, uh, that's a, lot, a big part of the access in our scenarios. All that with uh, new renewable energies, even uh, in access through networks, it will go through in this scenario with lots of uh, renewable energies for reasons, economic reasons and ecological reasons. So I will just end up by uh, uh, saying the thing, the following thing, it's, you really need to emphasize the, this, what we said, it's a really uh, uh, somewhere when we have lots of solutions, we know what to do and we need to uh, put a big accent in it, on it and these are the questions that are not compatible. We shouldn't even ask ourselves the questions, both things are the priority for us. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexandre Martin. I'm in charge of uh, the climate and natural resources topics within EDF. EDF stands for Electricité de France. Uh, you know, it's the, the, the biggest uh, green uh, d carbon dioxide less um, uh, electricity producer. We are very active we're in Europe, in the various European countries, towards a uh, uh, subsidiary. Uh, it's a medicine in France. But um, you might be surprised uh, by the fact that you are hearing about EDF in the framework of today's event. And that's the objective of my presentation, to, to showcase with humility what we do in Africa when it comes to hybrid, to off-grid, solutions, what's at stake in these countries that are among the less, uh, the less developed is to, uh, to supply and access to electricity to population that are among those who are the poorest uh, and to, uh, to, to make money out of it. Um, so it's an activity, it's, uh, oper these are operations for which the balances and in particular economic balances are quite um, quite fragile and this is the moment where I would like to skip to the to the next slide which I'm going to try to do while just oh that's great so what are we talking about when it comes to activities that we are pushing forward it's two main types of solutions quite class classical ones I guess you are familiar to the with them, it's uh, individual solar kits and solar pumps. What is it that we do in terms of that kind of activities? What is our role? Well, we, we first things first, we focus on countries we, we know best, in which we, we lead other operations. And what's the goal is to build these activities in partnership with solutions builders solutions that are uh, that have already proven efficient were both in terms uh, of individual solar kits and in terms of solar pumps just one focus point now about the partners with whom we work we work in zola and bbox when it comes to two so uh, to solar kits um, it's an activity that we started to develop, standard microgrid for the mini grids. It's an activity that, uh, that is more an emerging one. Zola, standard microgrid, sun culture. B-Box is, uh, is more, it's more solar pump 
wise. The good thing is to have integrated solutions between electricity production and the equipment that comes behind that come behind when it comes to uh, house solar grids, um, lights. The goal being to search for as much efficiency as possible with these integrated solutions and uh, electricity supply and electricity consumption. Next slide, please. Here we are. The, uh, the solar kits are developed mainly in Ivory Coast, Togo, and Kenya. Uh, it's also started to, uh, to emerge in South, South Africa. Now, when it comes to micro microgrids, it's more in Zambia for now. So the role of EDF, EDF in this whole story is, uh, I mean, our activity is about distribution. We are electricity suppliers. We base upon our work, upon well, our knowledge of these territories, of these countries. And our mission is to support our customers throughout these uh, electricity supplying activities, thanks to these microgrids and off-grid solutions, and to develop new operations that are made possible by this access to electricity, to irrigation also, because it's needed for solar groups. We are an industrial uh, player with a logic of lo with long-term vision. We are here to stay here. We're th the goal is not to come over, create an activity, create some operations, develop them, and then go away. We, we are here to remain with our customers with our partners on the long run, the objective being to make these activities, because I, I said the, the balances are quite fr fragile, so we, we want it to be efficient on the long, on the long term. It, it, it is about sustainability, and this is what creates trust between our partners and us. Uh, that's why a player, a big player such as EDF is needed, because these equipments, these activities, these operations need money, and we have two uh, supplying models. We have a list one, w which is a first period uh, during which a leasing is paid after, after what, after uh, a ch shortly thereafter, the customer becomes the owner. And we have another model. It's quite a similar one, but uh, the, the thing is, after the leasing period, uh, we just bring a maintenance maintenance uh, maintenance services for which services we are paid for and the customer doesn't become the uh, the owner so that's uh, yeah that's the very end in fact and that means these operations these activities come together with financement activity this is the logic of microfinance so we have to mobilize funds obviously and what's at stake is what, what's what's needed is to find cheap money and to cr to generate to to manage risks because you always it always comes with risk with default uh, risks so we have to find warranties in uh, cooperation with local authorities with public authorities in order to to work upon this default rate and these are the kind of warranties that are the key to the uh, economic viability of these operations uh, my a couple of last words. Our philosophy is about um, rural electrification. It is um, it is something else than what, what we've uh, we've been developing in uh, in uh, other countries because the irrigation is quite downstream. It's another logic, but the go the goal and the effect are quite the same. And what we witness here is that we are building bricks, small bricks, out of which we we, we build a wall. Uh, of uh, access to electricity. It's quite resilient and it could be integrated tomorrow to a grid, to an ever wider grid that will be working uh, quite differently, quite differently from the uh, uh, downward electric grids. In the context of electric transition with the enhancement of uh, renewable electricity productions in emerging countries, we could see a sort of, uh, of venture, of, of bridge building between both electric systems. I could talk a bit more about it, uh, but, but, uh, but 
what's at stake when it comes to these activities, and that's the last slide, we have a, a million customers uh, when it comes to these uh, activities, we'd like to make it five, five millions. That's our goal. Voilà, le trois. Merci. Thank you very much, Gilles. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, have three messages uh, and from where I am after the previous uh, persons. Uh, the challenges, the technologies, and the third one on the uh, lessons that uh, we can take. Out. First, the, the challenges. It's uh, quite interesting. It's very interesting because we here on a cup and from a cup to another, from one cup to another, we talk about the, the challenges, climate, carbon, net zero emissions, without talking about people. Uh, when you have a real vision that we share and uh, and uh, uh, engagement for a low carbon world. In 2015, 2015 where's the, 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 the world population? How do they, how do these people leave? It's not very present here. We look uh, how we're going to see the, 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 the energy production to get to have less carbon, of course. But the debate of this morning uh, gets us back to the question, where are the people and how do they live? And the world of low carbon with 80% of the world population that is poor, under the, the, the threshold of poverty, that, that makes no sense. And probably uh, that's not sustainable. It will be sustainable when we'll re reduce the carbon emissions and will allow a just development for the populations, uh, particularly in Africa, but also in Asia, we could, uh, for the populations of our own uh, countries, I mean, in OECD, OECD countries. But when we say this, uh, it gives us new ways for the innovation. The innovation is never as good uh, when it's under constraints. The constraint is the huge territory, like a uh, huge territory like Africa, with a population that has massively lack of access to, to energy today. When we're talking, when we're speaking now, and a young, very young population today, there is less young people on the planet than uh, than ever that, that has ever been the place. One point five. Uh, billion people uh, under the age of 20. They need the future. We here, we're talking about cl climate here, it's essential. We have to also watch the, the population and the innovation works on it. This is, it would be a challenge to say that it's not a small challenge in which uh, our nations take care of the future of the planet and would have a, a nice gesture, a philanthropic gesture, so uh, the other population are not poor. Now that's a key challenge of a planet. One on and only of a population, one and only, and we have to put two in a, uh, a movement of progress in which there is a climate, land, a climate that we've meant to, will maintain under one degree or 1.5 degree, a biodiversity we've worked on and we can see that uh, uh, to talk climate and biodiversity, uh, to take uh, engagements, these are, this is all connected and we cannot forget the populations. Second point, the technologies. Well, in the subject with, with what we're talking about today, the digital, more even more than in our companies, in our society, is a key of the, of the development. Schneider Electric uh, has put on the, on the market in 10 years, years with uh, partners like Electricien Saventier. They uh, pushed us to, to go uh, on the ground and to, to know the, the knowledge, like uh, solar charges for, for cell phones and others. To, make, to act in a way, in a situation where uh, when uh, there's no more families that have a, 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 a wood fire in, a, in the middle of, a, of one single room, solar system for a better future of these uh, families. And the mini grid, that's an excellent solution. We'll never have enough raw material to create mini grids like in Africa, like we, we did where we do it. In, in Europe, right? it's a huge continent. The villages are far away one from the others. Just the idea, as you were saying, uh, to say that we'll not, we'll be unable to export our solutions. The mini grid connected. This is uh, the solution. Why? Because we have lots of experience. Uh, Eighty mini grids in a, on a big territory. If it's not connected, when it needs requires maintenance and uh, 
update and there will be no people. We know what, what you have these, these tools that are not used uh, properly because finally they become uh, a gross cemetery of, uh, cemetery of batteries and panels because people have no competence. The connection of the, the, and the digital will uh, lead to an adaptation of the offer and of the demand. Uh, to be able to uh, to give the right price to the local uh, populations that will be able to afford this electricity and create development. And finally, this connection allows, as, as I was saying, the maintenance, the, the repairs. This is not inimaginable that there is an electrician uh, uh, behind every mini-grid. You see that this approach, a brown, a born within this population because it's a need, we can make a, a reverse the and, and get to a solutions that are uh, everywhere in the world, in this isolated farm uh, uh, in a country, in Europe, in, in the USA, uh, a farm that will uh, use as much energy as a village in Africa. These this solutions have to become mature. So uh, to engage in this uh, approach means to, uh, approach, to engage in innovation, indispensable for the world, and also capital for the, the population, their capacity of pro productivity, so they stay in the villages where they live because villages with no electricity, uh, these are villages that will be left by uh, uh, young people, which has an influence on immigration, on the agriculture, on the poverty. And we have, on the other side, these contributions that are unable to give um, work to all these populations. So we are in a capital subject when it's, we're talking money, risks, uh, when we're talking new models, but we can see that the electricity and the electrification, the digital, very important in these countries because you know the people has no access to electricity and they fight to, uh, to be able to recharge their, their phones. This is key. Three big challenges. The, the first being uh, to feed the, the planet, the population. And uh, when we bring these vinegars to these villages, uh, what, we did, what we've done in Senegal, uh, we've created uh, places to keep the onions Deed which allows to uh, to the farmers to, to to have a better income every month. Uh, it allows to have a onion production and the possibility to, to to sell them all the time and a better life locally. I think that that's an essential subject. The second essential subject, the the training, general standard electric uh, means two objects in 2025. 50, per, 50 million of the inhabitants in. Uh, uh, on the planet that will have that have no access to electricity in 21 have access to our solution to 25 and we want to train 1 million of the young people uh, uh, on electricity the Africa Africa has largely enough electricians uh, to give uh, the possibility to have 15 percent of people that have electricity in Africa it's a scandal massively to invest in order uh, that the young can have access to, to this training on electricity that can be basic six months or better for to, 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 create, to, to, to create better grids. It's offer young, young, young people their own future, the possibility to, to have a family and to, the possibility to sell electric uh, equipment. And we can uh, approach uh, financially this the question. Money is necessary, technology uh, has to be noted, but we have if we have not enough humans, what do we do? Because if we train people, they will be able to promote this, this approach. So this is the second objective of our tools uh, of uh, sustainable development. There's 11 indicators. Two, as we've said, 50 million people have, uh, 50 million people have access to, will have uh, uh, access to electricity and 1 million young people uh, are trained with our contribution of the electric, uh, Schneider Electric Foundation. So uh, when they build their own uh, wealth, they give a lot uh, to the territory. But the first thing you know that is women, because in all the ditches when there is no water pump, there's no electricity, who is going to go and get water and who's going to get and, and get the, the wood? It's women who spend their days on that. I've inaugurated lots of uh, villages in Africa where we bring a mini grid. The first one, the women say we finally have time for ourselves, we can learn and we change our, we're changing our lives. So these subjects we were talking about, SDG 7, it's about uh, 
challenges. We could talk about health in uh, cities uh, in, the, in the African province, but I would like to, uh, to emphasize on uh, one thing, the, 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 the life of women will never improve. There will have will be no access to electricity. Innovation, innovations in the digital, in the renewables, uh, at re affordable prices. Merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot, Gilles. From our side, from uh, the Electricien Sans Frontières side, we, we ask questions uh, as many NGOs. Sorry about that. Uh, I would, would like to remind who we, who we are. Electricien Sans Frontières is, is an NGO that has been fighting for more than 35 years against inequality in terms of access to electricity and water throughout the world, mobilizing mainly renewable energies that has been created thanks to the will of uh, playmakers from the energy sector in France that wanted to share their expertise. Now we have around 100 projects per year that are implemented in 24, 25 countries last year. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, talk about our uh, action principles that uh, let us take into account this double stake, uh, access to energy for populations that lack such an access. It's, uh, it's the SDG number seven and the fight against climate change. So how do we uh, translate that? First thing, we have to, uh, to meet the demands of local communities. They are at the core of the needs, as, as you said, by the way. So we have to meet these demands in a decentralized manner, as close to, uh, to the pe to people as possible mo while mobilizing by, throughout mobilizing local resources, human resources, first things first, but energy resources as well. In, in many, many zones there is no grid, as in Africa, in many, many, so solar, solar energy is available, lots of it, and we can mobilize it without uh, even taking into account the, uh, the environmental uh, footprint. Uh, we often talk about uh, sustainability, and this is one thing we take into consideration when it comes to competencies transfer locally, and the commi our commitment to follow up the projects uh, <coughs> during 10 years, minimum 10 years. This is one of the important things. Next, next slide, please. For the vast majority of our projects, these are project, uh, small projects because it's about uh, solar panel, panels installations on school roofs or pump um, in waterlands in the context of Sahel, for example, that is highly impacted by climate change. Uh, so that gives the possibility to people who raise vegetables greens to work in better conditions so it's 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 resilience and it's adaptation because it makes it makes food production easier so it's about a universal access to energy why because that's not a goal in itself electricity is not the, a goal in itself it's a service that gives the possibility to have a proper access to other goods uh, in order to uh, to, gi to, bir to give birth for example during the night uh, it takes electricity to uh, so uh, that's a priority for many populations, a number one priority, but you ha we have to bear in mind that it can be uh, pushed forward in a sustainable and decarbonized manner. One other thing we wanted to do uh, was to share our experience about um, some projects that, uh, that happen to be uh, game changers in territories that are electrified and about which we could think they are less concerned by this uh, project, but <coughs> but uh, it's Lebanon and, uh, Dom and Dominican Republic. This is the Repdom, Dominican Republic. This project has come up after an emergency intervention uh, after 2017, uh, just after the Maria Huragan. Uh, we have to bear in mind that like many small island states, the Dominican Republic, Republic um, is not taking part in the climate change, but is, is uh, impacted, is affected by, the, by climate change because there are many extreme weather events that affect this small country. Maria, Maria um, 
destructed the islands in 2017. We, there is a centralized, a very centralized elect electricity grid so that in case of failure, the whole island is going dark. Um, and that was a huge, uh, a huge issue. So we are, we are mobilizing uh, generators, but it's not, it's not a, a sustainable solution in our opinion. So we have to mobilize solar lamps as well and pumps. What's interesting as well is shortly thereafter, they will, uh, this made the uh, prime minister of their government take into account a different reconstruction of what has been done, had been done until then in terms of infrastructure. So the island, but because now they, ta they bear in mind that the, this might happen again. So they take that into account right away. Uh, thanks to us, thanks to a network of experts, uh, it has been, they've thought about the most essential services which are hospitals mainly, hospitals during uh, the uh, Maria Hurrigan, Hurrigan strike were, weren't in the capacity to work properly, which causes many fatalities. And I'm not talking about people who died in buildings, within in buildings, but about people who died in the uh, hospital corridors. We've been thinking, uh, we, we've come up together with a solution that happened to be quite important. Solar panels, we've installed solar panels on uh, roofs in 2018, solar panels that had been uh, conceived in order to resist to strong winds and that can be dismantled very easily and quickly before the hurricane. Uh, bearing in mind that you always get three days, uh, three days autonomy in terms of battery, so that they can work during three days, even if there is no sun at all, like, for example, during a hurricane. So that shows you can uh, use renewable energies and that these centers are independent in terms of energy, even when the grid, the grid doesn't produce, that gives the possibility to reduce their dependency and the energy bill by the same occasion. Uh, what has been done as well is we've created a solar field uh, throwing more energy within the classic grid. So it's, it's decarbonization as well by the same uh, occasion. This project has uh, uh, given birth to six centers, six um, city centers and one uh, retirement house for the elderly. So it has got, uh, it has had many positive consequences. That's a more recent example in a less, uh, uh, in a territory we, lo we know less, it's Lebanon. It's also considered uh, as a highly electrified country, but it, they've went into, uh, they, they've been through uh, a, a huge crisis after the blow up uh, at Beir Beirut port. Um, many quarters ha have been destroyed and we've seen how to mobilize renewable energies in order to, um, to, uh, to fight against a crisis, an extraordinary crisis such as this one. It has had repercuss political repercussions as well. So if to focus, that's it. As you see on the screen, for those who see it, you see the impact. Uh, th is, this is uh, in the context of economic uh, crisis with uh, many, many people going poor in Lebanon uh, from the middle class as well with uh, um, a spectacular inflation and the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic. So it, uh, as you see how the city looked like, how the grid looked like, so there has been an emergency action from our side and we've come up with di a diagnosis thinking mid-run, not long-term but mid-run midterm, what can we do uh, n nearly right away? And we've thought about schools. Why schools? Because the thing is, in Lebanon, the education system is uh, ensured by the private sector. And these private, private schools have been hugely affected because many families were in the capacity to pay for their, for their schools. And second, the cost um, was much higher 
because the grid wouldn't work 24 seven. So they would have to, to use uh, generators that, have that are very costly and, and not very clean. So uh, we've identified, we've chosen six schools quite close to Beirut port in order to install uh, solar panels. So we, there, there are no batteries over there. So it's, uh, it's just for the day, not for the night. But you don't pollute, that's one thing. And you re-inject right in the grid some power when the grid is functioning. So then we are sure about the resilience and the continuity of the service. We know it, it can last, not 24-7, but during the day, as long as you have sun. It's decarbonizing the, ener the energy mix, by the way, because this is about inject injecting solar power. And by the same occasion, you reduce the energy bill, because that's, that's for the uh, essential populations, apart from the environmental costs. We hope this project can, uh, can have other unexpected positive consequences, showing that even in highly electrified countries such as Lebanon, it remains possible, as uh, Alexandre was saying, to think about uh, decentralized el electrification models so that in case of what? In case of war, blow up, catastrophe, you can ensure a decarbonized uh, elect electricity offer that will be affordable, as affordable as it gets anyway. And that would be about it when it comes to our uh, experiences. I would like to underline that this is a whole ecosystem, as you see today. These are projects that are led by different uh, types of partners from the private sector, from the public sector, from the NGOs. That gives the possibility to set that kind of projects. It's, I, th I think it is hugely important, both in human terms, in climate terms, in electricity terms, and in terms of uh, building competencies, diverse competencies. Thanks a lot. My proposal now would be, because uh, the, uh, the, the Association of uh, Rural Electrification for Africa leader uh, couldn't, make, couldn't make it here. He's in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. He wanted to, um, to, s to tell a few words as well about this matter. We'll have the possibility to listen to him now. Je vous présente euh, Ariane Jantav, secrétaire exécutif de l'Association africaine pour l'électrification rurale, plus connue sous le terme Club ER. Le Club ER est un réseau de compétences panafricaines, des structures nationales et des agences nationales en charge de l'accès à l'énergie. Nos membres sont au nombre de 45 répartis dans 32 pays en Afrique. Et notre objectif est d'améliorer l'accès à l'énergie à travers en fait, le renforcement de capacité et la gestion de connaissances. Nos activités de formation et nos publications s'articulent autour de cinq thèmes principaux, à savoir les aspects organisationnels du secteur, le mécanisme de financement et la régulation, les spécifications allégées, les impacts de l'électrification rurale et la méthodologie pour la planification. Ce midi, j'ai le privilège de vous partager le point de vue de notre association au regard du thème proposé, qui est l'accès universel à l'énergie moderne et la lutte contre le changement climatique. Nous sommes ravis de participer virtuellement à ce COP26 à travers cette vidéo enregistrée depuis Abidjan, notre siège. Avant d'aller plus loin, euh, je remercie Électricien Sans Frontières et ses partenaires d'avoir bien voulu nous associer à cet événement. Ceci dit, entrons maintenant dans le vif du sujet. Comment concilier l'accès universel à une énergie moderne avec la lutte contre le dérèglement climatique Vu d'ici, le traitement de ce sujet se fera sous deux angles. En amont de la distribution l'utilisation de l'énergie renouvelable pour la production d'électricité en zone rurale et en aval de la distribution, l'impact de l'électrification rurale sur le développement local, régional et national. Nous admettons tous que les énergies renouvelables sont des meilleures solutions pour l'électrification rurale. Toutefois, on a étudié les projets d'accès 
à l'énergie basée sur ces énergies renouvelables risque de ne pas donner les résultats escomptés. Je m'explique. Prenons le cas de, euh, des énergies euh, hydroélectriques, le projet à base basé sur l'hydroélectricité. Les mesures pour la protection des bassins versants, gages de pérennité de ressources en eau, ne sont pas souvent incluses dans le coût des projets. Nous ne maîtrisons pas à l'échelle locale la pluviométrie, certes, mais nous pouvons agir sur le bassin versant. Nous pouvons optimiser la ressource en eau en protégeant le bassin versant. Malheureusement, ces mesures pour la protection des bassins versants ne sont pas très souvent financées par les partenaires financiers. Ces derniers considèrent les coûts liés au génie civil, les coûts liés à la production et à la distribution et au branchement, et rarement en fait pour les parties environnementales. Donc, faute de moyens pour protéger le bassin versant, les ressources en eau se raréfient et la production est perturbée. Nous recommandons donc en fait pour concilier l'accès universel à avec la lutte contre le changement climatique, d'intégrer dans le calcul des coûts de revient en fait, les charges liées à la gestion environnementale. Maintenant, qu'est-ce qui se passe en aval de la distribution Nous visons dans un premier temps la, la satisfaction de nos abonnés, de nos bénéficiaires finaux. Les branchés, notre objectif est de les brancher à une énergie moderne. Beaucoup d'entre nous se félicitent lorsque un abonné est branché. Or, l'électricité est tout simplement un moyen. Ce n'est pas une fin en soi. Avec ce résultat, c'est-à-dire un abonné branché, on doit aider ce bénéficiaire à utiliser l'électricité issue d'une énergie moderne pour transformer leur récolte. Il faut les accompagner pour trouver les moyens pour générer des revenus à partir de cette électricité. Certes, ce n'est pas le rôle des électriciens, mais je pense que c'est un devoir. L'idée étant d'aider les usagers, d'accompagner les artisans à moderniser leurs outils de travail, leurs outils de production. On confie aux opérateurs d'énergie le rôle de producteur, de distributeur d'électricité. Mais il faut également à leur côté une structure qui appuie les usagers à s'équiper. Il faut convaincre les usagers à abandonner un moteur technique qui alimentait les moulins et les aider à acquérir des moteurs électriques branchés sur le réseau en utilisant de l'énergie moderne. Cette démarche aura d'ailleurs un double effet. Pour le producteur d'énergie, il verra sa courbe de charge ici et pour l'environnement, on limitera les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Bien entendu, ceci a un coût. Dorénavant, nous avons de nombreux programmes qui financent les usages productifs. Nous recommandons vivement nos membres, les agences d'électrification rurale et les départements ministériels, à multiplier le partenariat afin que les usages productifs soient financés. Cette stratégie passe aussi par une réflexion multisectorielle avec les autres départements concernés, à savoir le ministère en charge du développement rural, le ministère en charge des ressources en eau pour le pompage, la télécommunication, l'artisanat, etc. Pour finir, l'Association africaine pour l'électrification rurale recommande à ses membres d'élargir son périmètre de partenariat et de chercher à faire financer le volet de protection de l'environnement de son programme d'une part et d'autre part de travailler avec les autres projets de développement pour aider les bénéficiaires finaux à accéder facilement aux équipements électriques modernes. Voilà, en quelques minutes, le point de vue de l'association africaine pour l'électrification rurale, le Club ER, sur le sujet du jour. Alors, nous vous remercions et nous sommes disposés à répondre à vos questions. Merci beaucoup. end up I just wanted to uh, to say a short word to thank you all for your uh, 
speeches we've had uh, we've seen different points of view on the on the on the issue thanks to all the persons who have been uh, here with us and those who have, who have been watching youtube live i think that we've seen that there were there are solutions modern solutions to give access to 10 percent of the population that who today has no access maybe there's a question it's a question of finances of organization but we know what to do there's another thing that that is important for us as an actors of uh, international solidarity is to tell each other that as uh, NGOs we have to, uh, to, 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 to think uh, in the perspective of 40 years, 30 years, uh, because if, if, if we don't put on, uh, if we don't implement solutions, the impacts will be uh, strong in 20, 30 years. It's a case for the NGO, but it's also a case for the for a government and a big company, especially as uh, the persons who have no access to energy today uh, live usually in uh, in zones that uh, that they will be impacted by the climatic changes but let's give a word of hope at the end because it's important we can say that today uh, africa represents 40 percent of the po of solar uh, potential international solar solar potential but we don't have uh, 40 percent that has that is being used so uh, we are just at the beginning of this adventure so if we answer to this problem with using our key we are pretty sure about the future and I think this will be make a junk, junction with the next subject that uh, has led into the solar and its development and how it may answer to uh, today's problems. Thank you again. I can see that there's five minutes left. So uh, if you want, we can uh, uh, answer the questions if there are any. Do not hesitate to ask questions. <laughs> My question, you spoke about implementing a uh, uh, monitoring of a project for 10 years. Do you have teams uh, that are there to follow the project, to monitor the project, and how do you uh, monitor them? Are you go there in situ? Uh, even when we talk about trainings for young people who are there for the batteries, for the uh, for the solar systems and for the grids, what, what do you do and how do you do uh, to make uh, uh, to, 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 to refrain people from going to, to cities to make more uh, money if you trade them for free? Hello, thank you very much for the preferred presentation. My name is Ichev Tosibamula. I'm uh, uh, from RDC. I'm a, I'm a chief uh, uh, of uh, the electrification uh, department in in, uh, in the Congo. I like uh, what we what we've heard. But I just wanted to know if there were another example uh, where we uh, basically we do not limit ourselves ourselves to uh, access of electricity, but also with uh, access to transformation because this will bring the changes and will stabilize the, the rural uh, areas. This is something that should be, the inclusive approach should be uh, uh, promoted. Thank you. I think I work for Natural Science. Uh, my question uh, is, is simple. We're talking about the necessity to bring solutions uh, of electrification in Africa. I just wanted to know if there are, if there were zones, areas in the continent that uh, have more they are more concerned that have more needs uh, in terms of this, of the subject. Yes, Maxi Marquez. I am a student in an engineering school in France. I would like to to know more what you understand by the connected mini grids. I I would like to understand what it is. Thank you very much for your questions. We won't be uh, we won't be able to take more questions because the next event will start. I will answer to the first question concerning the electricity and Centre Frontier. So very quickly, we, uh, when it comes to the monitoring of the installations, our teams of vol volunteers exchange with the soci local associations in order to grid uh, um, for monitoring indicators that would be relevant. So we talk with them and uh, 
Uh, we ensured that everything goes well uh, in time. So this is a team of the project that shares um, information with the uh, Electricité Sans Frontières. Each time we make a mission when we're implementing a project, we try to associate a f the, the monitoring of the projects that have been already impl implemented around. That's another way to approach it. And finally, when uh, we uh, when we see uh, uh, a dysfunctioning, the project can uh, use a, f a special font that we created for this need that could replace the equipment in case uh, uh, occurs with that if there's not enough uh, finances at the time. So that's the one uh, way, to, one of the ways to, to answer to the needs. Thank you very much. One uh, word about our action. We have a certain number of projects that mobilize mini uh, micro uh, grids where we understand when we see that um, uh, our help is absolutely central. So this is the key of the growth of access to energy and its sustainability within time. So we absolutely, absolutely agree with you. To answer two questions quickly, I think that uh, the, the huge question is uh, what was said in the, uh, in the video. The exercise is not a goal in itself. It's what issues do we want to resolve or what questions. We want to have uh, health institutions everywhere in Africa and there is no uh, health with no electricity without, uh, without production, oxygen production, and so on and so on. There's no uh, agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture, without electricity. There is no uh, life quality in a village. Uh, we're talking about public lights, uh, but also safety of the, and of the residents. We have to think about these usages and when we think about them we find the financial means to uh, to to make the mini grid viable but the, the worst thing is to mini grid given just like that that costs nothing to nobody uh, and so everyone thinks that electricity is free we have lots of uh, experiences that show that it that doesn't work but these mini grids that allow to uh, to avoid to have a full uh, uh, diesel generators, but instead to have something silenced with no carbon emission that allowed to uh, to a place where the, the, the onions are produced, or in India, for example, that allowed to, to pump and to irrigate the water. This is key because by this usage, we find the financial means that wouldn't have found if it was just about uh, bringing a, a charge for the, for your for your cell phone or the or, or a light. And to answer your question, uh, we can talk later, by the way. Vilaya and Microsol, these are two names of the of uh, Schneider Electric Mini Grids, uh, connected mini grids. Uh, connected means that's uh, that's a mini grid with a local production, solar, very often, uh, that has the capacity to go to the client and to connect through the connection to know to get the knowledge of how the system functions when it consumes uh, consumes energy produces energy and who can uh, who use this energy way well, when and we need someone who's uh, who can be able to to pilot this uh, several mini grids so he knows where what when and how to repair there are no connection system there are no uh, of course the gps too but uh, that, that work with in the zones where, where there's no gps uh, talking about africa in Uganda, for example, I remember mine, f f less than 5% of people have access to electricity. Uh, honestly, uh, in the heart of the subcompetent, uh, there's lo lots of needs. To conclude, we can talk uh, the Sahel region. Uh, we spoke a lot about it. Uh, French-speaking uh, countries, Burkina Faso, for example, Nigeria, and we have lots of uh, countries that uh, have really uh, low percentages of people with access to electricity um, compared to their neighbors. Thank you all. We, I think we went over our time. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, let the next subject come because otherwise they, won't, they will have no time to present what they have to.
CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Your Excellency Minister Jean-Yves Ladrian, Your Excellency Dr. Ajay Mathur. Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to what is clearly, evidently, going to be a very exciting session. Today is the festival of Diwali. So let me first wish you a very happy Diwali. But the festival of Diwali is also when we make new beginnings, when we make new friends, and when we think of a brighter future. The session we have today will hopefully enlighten us about that brighter future for solar and renewables across the world. The new beginning we have to make is no longer about ideas. It's no longer even about action. It has to be about scale. The technology is known. The policies are there. The targets have been set. The last time I had the privilege of meeting Minister Ladrian, he delivered a passionate speech in New Delhi, along with our then environment minister. And since then, India has declared a target of 500 gigawatts of non-fossil capacity within the next decade. And across the developing world, there is that urgency of moving rapidly to scale. We will hear in this session about the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiative, which was initially launched at COP24 in December 2018 with the objective of attracting affordable private investment in optimized conditions for both grid-connected and off-grid renewables projects to reduce the reliance on public finance and crowd in private finance at scale and also to maximize the socio-economic benefits of the energy transition. You will learn what has SRMI achieved thus far and what the vision is going forward. We are also particularly privileged to have representatives of the partner organizations of SRMI, which includes, of course, the French AFD, the International Solar Alliance, the International Renewable Energy Agency, and Sustainable Energy for All. Let me now warmly welcome Minister Ladrian to deliver his keynote address and once again ignite us on this day of Diwali of where we head from here. Minister Ladrian. Mr. Moderator, Director General, thank you very much for welcoming here today. We met before, and I always have great pleasure remind, remembering this. We met during an event of the International Solar Alliance, which we partook in, in Delhi with President Macron. But we also met recently in an exchange that we had at the French Embassy in New Delhi. And what I want to tell you today is that France is very proud to preside the International Solar Alliance with India. And I'm particularly happy to be able to celebrate this today in this national holiday because we are both willing to do everything we can to help every country to make progress towards sustainable development. We're very proud to have been able to bring a 1 million euro grant to help this alliance. And I would like to remind you that um, when we met for the first time in New Delhi, France had uh, committed, through the French president, a commitment of 1.5 million euros, mil billion euros, mostly for renewable energies, and today, Almost 1.3 billion have been earmarked for the solar power in order to be able to fund specific projects. And this will help develop 3,400 megawatts of solar capacity. 
we are very proud of this. The philosophy of this alliance, with, which was surrounded by some hesitancy to start with, and we are very happy to see it go in the right direction. We're also very proud to support the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiative, which was developed by the Solar Alliance with the help of the World Bank and the International Renewable Energy Agency. The French Development Agency, the AFD, has contributed uh, through a new guarantee tool that has been created through the implementation of a solar project in Mozambique. In order to upgrade uh, this uh, tool, the AFD has mobilized uh, a counter-guarantee funding of 50 million euros. This is a European project that will be carried out through the European Guarantee for Renewable Energy. The reason why we want to support this initiative is because we believe that it can play a key role in helping countries have access to financial resources, especially those deemed risky, and help the private sector invest and be offered the necessary guarantees. This will help its countries have access to the necessary financial resources in order to implement renewable energy projects, especially solar projects. This initiative uh, has now uh, started its operational implementation thanks to an, a fun funding of $280 million from the Green Climate Fund, and this will help implement many projects in member states. Our partners from the World Bank, whom I would like to take this opportunity to thank warmly, will tell us more in detail how these innovative tools are going to help mobilizing local funding institutions and private investors and put them at best use in favor of renewable energies. I would also like to take this opportunity to celebrate the joining of new member states to reinforce the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiatives and better bring the private sector on board. We believe that this is uh, paramount, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to see that uh, the uh, initial momentum has been kept, making sure that uh, we are able to reap the benefits of our efforts in favor of uh, renewable energies and especially strengthening solar energy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Minister Lodrio, for outlining the actions that are already underway. The, the range of blended finance instruments that are being developed to deliver that scale at the urgency that we were talking about. Now it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Dr. Ajay Mathru, whom I respect a lot, but also consider as a dear friend, to join us on this platform and deliver your vision, of, of course, and your energy to this initiative. Many thanks, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Minister Lidrian, my dear friend Arunaba, all colleagues, it's such a pleasure to be here with you on this, as Arunaba said, this day of Diwali in India, the Festival of Lights, and what can be more appropriate than bringing lights, solar lights, all across the world, thanks to this initiative, the SRMI. It is self-evident that renewables, particularly solar energy, have emerged as the most robust global solution for diverse economies to meet our Paris Agreement goals. Minister Lidrian talked about how we have moved ahead in enabling this. We, as the Solar Alliance, of which we are very proud to have France as a co-founder, the Solar Alliance notes that in many countries around the world, there are structural problems to the growth of renewables. Our colleagues, the World Bank, notes that at least 950 gigawatts of solar PV and 580 gigawatts of wind energy must be installed in developing countries by 2025. We have only four years to do so. 
Why is it not happening? It's not as if these countries don't have wind. It's certainly not the case that these countries don't have solar. It occurs because the international money feels discomfort in investing in these countries. That's what the SRMI looks to resolve. We, this, as the minister said, was first proposed at the ISA's inaugural summit in March 2018 with the goal of mobilizing $1,000 billion, a trillion dollars, for uh, investment in solar energy. And as the minister rightly said, we would like the vast bulk of this, if not all of it, to be drawn from the private sector. As we look ahead, the SRMI, together with the World Bank, together with the AFD, with IRENA, and of course with ISA, has now shown its capability to make policies attractive for private sector investment. National policies are important. Minister, you will note, you will remember, as we have spoken in various countries, that countries were very happy to invest in solar, but only if they see benefits flowing out of it. Benefits in terms of investments in solar, benefits in terms of lower electricity prices for the constituents, benefits in terms of more jobs. And as the set of policies which enable this, bring in this investment, it becomes self-reinforcing to make those policy changes. This is what SRMI seeks to do. To reach this objective of large-scale private sector investment, to unlock it, we will need to continuously increase the kinds of uh, unlocking that is needed for this money to flow, for people to be comfortable, for the investors to be comfortable in coming and investing in solar energy. I look forward to the discussion today, but in particular, I want to thank Monsieur Lidrian and all of you for this strong view of support of the SRMI, and together, I believe, we can make the difference. Thank you very much. As ever, you never disappoint Dr. Mathur with your energy. Uh, we will now hear a video message from Mr. Demetrius Papathanasio, who's the Global Director for the Energy and Extractives Global Practice at the World Bank. So you will know a little bit more in detail how the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiative works. to join you virtually for this important discussion on how to unlock solar energy deployment at scale. Three years ago, at COP24, we came together, the World Bank, the AFD, IRENA, and SC for All, to launch the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiative, SRMI, a program to help developing countries unleash the full potential of their renewable energy resources by reducing barriers to private sector investment. Today, at this COP26, it is my great pleasure to take stock with you of where we stand on this initiative and to hear the perspective of the countries that we're working with under the SRMI. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, we're working together with the government to unlock large-scale mini-grids and facilitate the commercial financing 
with the support of the Green Climate Fund and the expertise from our IFC colleagues. In Burkina Faso, we are working to almost double the penetration of solar in the energy mix. This will generate substantial savings for the country, increase the resilience of the grid, and create optimized conditions for private sector investment. In Vietnam, we are working hand in hand with the Ministry of Energy to mitigate the risk of curtailment of renewable energy and to avoid adverse impacts on the grid. In three years, the World Bank has mobilized a total of $675 million in climate finance for SRMI projects. These funds are expected to be blended with $2.7 billion of World Bank financing and to leverage $10 billion of private investments. The program would support 7 gigawatts of renewable energy and one and a half gigawatt hours of battery storage and would provide energy access to around 12 million people. Of course, we need to do more. A lot remains to be accomplished to successfully redirect financial flows in favor of low carbon and resilient development pathways. Issues like the integration of variable renewable energy in the grid or access by the private sector to adequate risk mitigation coverage continue to delay countries' ability to build solid pipelines of renewable projects. More than ever, governments have a catalytic role to play and create the conditions that will enable them to make the most out of their renewable energy resources while ensuring that renewable investments create employment and better living conditions for their population. That is why we plan to continue to scale up SRMI with the support of key partners, such as the Green Climate Fund. Building on our excellent collaboration, the World Bank is planning to submit a second SRMI facility to the Green Climate Fund for $160 million to support the energy transition of nine countries. We aim, by 2025, to mobilize $1 billion of climate finance and unlock 20 gigawatts of renewable energy, leveraging more than $20 billion of private investments for more than 20 countries. We look forward to working closely with participating countries and development partners under the SRMI initiative and continue to develop renewable energy resources cheaper, faster, and better. Well, there you have it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, to the World Bank for articulating the scale of this imagination and as if we can get to the 20 billion dollars for 20 countries of mobilized financing by 2025 that certainly begins to move the needle. So it, now I would like to thank Minister Ladrion and Dr. Adjimathur for gracing us in this plenary session and I would now request the panelists to join us up here starting with um, <clears throat> Mr. Francesco La Camera the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, Ms. Kavita Sinha, Deputy Director Division of the Mitigation Adaptation for the Green Climate Fund, and Ms. Kanika Chavla, the Program Manager for the UN Energy for Sustainable Energy Fall.
Right, we are all kitted out now. Um, so you heard what the SRMI initiative is all about. But the big question for me still is, is that enough? Can we do more? Can we do more and faster? Um, just to give one example, I was calculating the other day the latest announcements from India uh, for renewable energy and non-fossil energy by 2030 would mean that every single working hour for the next nine years, India has to deploy 10 and a half megawatts of renewable energy. So the 45 minutes that you spend here with us, seven and a half megawatts should have been deployed in India. Otherwise, you got to catch up. So this is this breathless marathon that we have to be on. And what does uh, the net zero target translate? It translates to 5,600 gigawatts of solar by 2070. So we are looking at a scale of energy transformation that has never been witnessed before. And it has to play out across nearly 200 countries across the world. That is a materials challenge. It is a manpower challenge. And most of all, it is a money challenge. And therefore, how do we get there faster is really the homework before all of us. It gives me huge pleasure now to first request Mr. Francesco La Camera, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, to tell us what is IRENA doing? Of course, you're partnering on SRMI, but what else is IRENA doing on driving scaled investment in renewables? Mr. Lakamera, please. So, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with uh, with you, and uh, I wish to thank the my friend from the International Solar Alliance, the World Bank, and the French government for uh, having us here today. And I think it's uh, a kind of relief that finally we may have the chance to meet in person, and uh, some time in trying to recognize that strange people that was in the video and uh, realize that we are human being, and then <laughs> you can hug him, and etc. So, uh, you know, uh, as a funding partner of this initiative, the SRMI is very important to ARENA, because uh, its mission is uh, at the core of what we, we do. According to the ARENA World Energy Transition Outlook, launched earlier this year, a total of uh, 131 trillion of US dollar is, will be needed to realize the pathway to achieve a net zero in 2050. And this is uh, 33 million more than uh, what current strategies and plans in place envisaged. The mission of uh, SRMI mobilizing 80, 150 million US dollar of concessional finance to unlock 8 gigawatts of renewables in over 20 developed countries by 2025 is, has been said, an ambitious one and push us to do more. A record level of 260 gigawatts of renewable capacity was deployed in 2020, the year of the pandemic, of which solar PV continues to dominate with new addition reaching 127 gigawatt in 2020. Solar PV is also increasingly the cheapest source of clean energy technology. Price has been followed by 85% between 2010 and 2020, and now at world average of around 5 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, naturally there are countries where we go for 1.5 cents or 1.7 cents. So it's really impressive. It has been a, a remarkable dec decade of change, but this progress is uneven. And we see that countries that need energy access, the most are making the least progress. Imagine over the 2060 gigawatt, last year only 1% was deployed in, in Africa. 
Arena is working on a portfolio of initiatives and financing facility to help change this reality in the spirit of what we are doing together in this initiative. I will give you a very short overview. Firstly, the risk assessment mitigation platform facilitates access to risk mitigation solution for renewable energy projects in developed and emerging markets. There is already a platform that is working in ARENA. It maps and uh, explains the landscape of existing risk mitigation instruments, including their eligibility criteria and due diligence process documentation requirement. Secondly, we have the Climate Investment Platform, a joint initiative of ARENA, the UNDP, c for all and uh, in collaboration with the Green Climate Fund. The platform works to provide support across different elements of importance to investment, from enabling frameworks to the creation of a pipeline of projects. Despite the health crisis, we have been made significant progress. We have been receiving 260 projects in the, to, to the platform, and uh, 35 have been brought close to the finalization of, uh, of the documentation to be considered bankable. This is equivalent to approximately 470 megawatt in capacity and a reduction of greenhouse emission of 5 million ton of CO2 once the project, project will be implemented. Lastly, let me mention the energy transition accelerating financing platform that we launched yesterday, uh, at COP26, in partnership with the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development and the UAE, UAE government. The platform aims to convene multiple global financial institutions to mobilize approximately one billion US dollar to support the energy transition, with the, the ambition to scale up investment levels to three billion US dollars. So we are grat grateful to the UAE, the United Emirates, our host country for already allocating 400 million US dollars to the platform so that we can start to be uh, operationalized in the platform already next year. This uh, initiative demonstrates ARENA's commitment to contribute to the SMI advancement. We want to bring value added to the initiative in collaboration with our friends from, from India and elsewhere. The whole world is looking at what is happening here in Glasgow. We must bring a message of hope, a concrete result. ARENA is glad to be working with all of you, as only through partnership that we will be able to progress at the necessary scale and speed. Grazie molte. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lacamara, for outlining the details of the uh, risk assessment mitigation platform, the climate investment platform, and the newly launched energy transition accelerating, accelerated financing platform. So now let's go to uh, the money bags. Uh, let's go to the Green Climate Fund. And Ms. Sinha, you just heard uh, from uh, uh, the World Bank that they are looking to now submit the proposal for the second phase of the SRMI. Tell us a little bit about what that first phase experience has been in terms of mobilizing that climate investment uh, so that that can then be leveraged for more money through the World Bank and then, of course, crowding in private capital. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having uh, GCF and me especially to be here. Um, this year in 2021, GCF funded projects worth $10.4 billion for energy transition, of which the GCF's direct contribution was $1.3 billion. GCF really believes that in order to create a climate safe and a climate resilient world, energy transition in this decade has to significantly accelerate. And that's our commitment. That's the reason when the World Bank brought to us the SRMI phase one, which focuses on six countries in Africa, some of the poorest countries, uh, with very low level of electrification, as well as one in uh, Central Asia. Uh, we not only were very pleased with the way the program was structured, because it was structured exactly 
what GCF's mandate is about. GCF's mandate is about crowding in private sector funding. GCF's mandate is about crowding in public sector funding where it would not otherwise go. So we have a very strong additionality criteria that needs to be fulfilled. And by and large, uh, the latest reports from the CPI, the Climate Policy Institute, indicates that the amount of funding that is being mobilized for climate finance, very small amount of that is going to developing countries, countries that the most need it. Of the $600 billion that was mobilized uh, last year, a very small percentage went to developing countries. Of that, mostly went to large emerging economies. Very little to the least developed countries, to the SIDS and Africa, which is where the most demand for energy is, which is where the most demand for energy access is. Money is not going there. And that's where GCF's value add comes. We try and blend um, finance with public development funding and private capital to make that work for the least developed countries as well as SIDS and Africa. We follow a four-pronged approach for that. Our four-pronged approach uh, for paradigm shift in the short amount of time that is needed at the scale and pace that is needed to meet the goals of Paris Agreement to keep the world at 1.5 degrees Celsius. The window is short, as you said. Uh, our four-pronged approach focuses on the first prong is integrated policy planning and programming, which means no more should the countries be looking at programming separately for financing and budgeting separately for sustainable development on one hand, meeting the, uh, you know, the climate goals on the other hand, and meeting recovery, COVID recovery on the other hand. We need to create synergies and we need to make sure the capital is used efficiently. Uh, our uh, research shows that if that is done as in an integrated manner, capital requirement reduces by 40%. So our programs focus on enabling an integrated planning and integrated mobilization of capital as a result of that. Our second prong is about financing and catalyzing innovation. SRMI again meets that criteria really well. Uh, it, it creates the platform for creating uh, storage and flexibility in the grid that enables larger amount of uh, capital deployment by the private sector. Dispatchability and the grid instability becomes one of the biggest challenges for the private capital mobilization. And this is where I think the SRMI scores by focusing the public investment where it needs the most. On creating infrastructure, public, public money is only used for creating the infrastructure that enables the private sector to then deploy the fund. Our third prong approach is on as I've been speaking about mobilizing capital at scale. NSMI, of course, is set to do that. We invested $280 million of GCF funding in that, uh, and that was one of the first investors that came to SRMI. Even the World Bank board approved the project after uh, GCF approved the project. Uh, given the urgency of it, uh, World Bank and uh, GCF concluded the negotiations of the uh, agreement one day within 24 hours of the board approval in March. So that's the criticality that we are working towards with the partners, and that's what we look forward for from others to show that this is really critical. We signed the agreement and the program was launched. Uh, $280 million is deployed in a multiple of instruments, grants for doing the uh, public sector uh, institutional capacity and lawmaking that is required to de-risk uh, the auction mechanism. Mm -hmm. We invested uh, equity, uh, we, sorry, we invested uh, guarantees for the private sector IPP investments to come forward. And we also invested reimbursable grants for storage and grid infrastructure. And then, of course, there was a sovereign uh, loan that uh, was then deployed and added to by the World Bank. And then hopefully that will inspire the other private sector to invest in it. And a fourth and final prong is what I think today is all about, which is uh, knowledge sharing and creating feedback loops so that the lessons that are being learned in this rapid world are fed back into the system so that the next generation of projects, or phase two, as you mentioned, Arunaba, that comes, already builds in the experiences that have had. We don't have time to make mistakes anymore. So that's what we are doing, and we hope that GCF's investment pro provides confidence to other investors to come on after us. That's what we are here for, to crowd in uh, private sector and public sector funding. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh that's, that is a, certainly a comprehensive approach, so we look forward to the phase two. But now let me turn to Ms. Kanika Chavla. Kanika, you do not need any convincing about the importance of risk mitigation since you and I have plotted on this for many years. Um, but let me provoke you a little bit more before you intervene. 
Uh, I just recently undertook a review of more than two dozen climate finance initiatives launched over the last decade. And uh, while nearly all of them talked about mobilizing private capital, uh, less than 10 of them focused, had anything to say about risk mitigation, and none was doing it at scale. So while SRMI seems exciting, the point is we need more, and we need, we need to rethink our entire approach towards renewable energy financing. So tell us about the conversations you've been leading uh, in the Technical Working Group on Finance via UN Energy, and tell us what new lessons can feed into, say, the design of SRMI2. Thank you so much, Arunaba, and it's just such a pleasure to be here. The, the sustainable um, risk mitigation initiative is something that I care about very deeply. We've worked on several iterations of it for several years now, so I, I, it's very good to finally see transactions happening through the SRMI. Um, the piece that I'd like to kind of focus on a little bit is something that Dr. Mathur said right at the start. Investors don't feel comfortable in investing in renewables in developing countries. That is the problem that SRMI is trying to solve. It is both a real risk as well as a perceived risk challenge that it's trying to fix. As you said, the scale of the problem is so large that it requires, it's not enough to use concessional capital, whether it's you know, international public money or, or national public money, to then just do project financing. You need the private sector to come in. And the SRMI then says, you perceive all these risks, or there are all these risks, and we will underwrite A, B, and C risk that makes a particular strong, robust pipeline of projects that can then, that are bankable, that are, um, you're able to create a secondary market for it, you're able to aggregate them. And this is, it's a really good response to a lot of the announcements that came out here at COP26 yesterday, where financial institutions um, and networks of financial institutions made commitments about mainstreaming uh, green energy and, and renewable energy and said, well, we have the capital ready if you have the pipeline ready. And the SRMI does enable the creation of a pipeline in countries that would otherwise be left behind. Um, as Francesco said, he was talking about how so little of the new capacity being added um, is in developing countries or in, in island states, and that's really where the focus needs to be. If you look at aggregate numbers, there is capital flowing, there is renewables happening, the global energy transition is well underway. No one has any doubt about what the future energy system is going to look like. But which are the countries that will get left behind if we don't help them? And that is where instruments like the SRMI are going to be critical. So then linking all of this to the deliberations that we've had through the UN Energy High Level Dialogue and Energy process earlier this year, um, there was this technical working group on finance and investment that came up with nine recommendations. And I'll talk about the ones that align most closely um, with the, the SRMI initiative. And interestingly, a lot of Kavita, your points were directly in line with, with those uh, recommendations. How do you unlock more? It is not about which is the one single silver bullet to unlock capital. You need every single kind of mechanism out there just because of the type of challenge we have on hand. How do you serve underserved markets? This includes distributed renewable energy as well as countries that are otherwise not seeing the capital flow. And finally, how do you create clean energy markets? It isn't enough to finance projects or to see through plans that are kind of, you know, for one year, two year, three years. It is how do you create well-functioning, self-sustaining, deep clean energy markets that are not distorted perhaps with the use of public money but are rather enabled by the use of public money. And this is why, through the UN energy process, we've started accepting um, commitments of actions from countries as well as from the private sector and others, where uh, government, national governments as well as private sector have already committed to over $600 billion of investment and spending in renewable energy and on, on actually all elements of SDG 7, so including energy access as well as efficiency. But that, and that sounds like a very large number if you could compare it to the 100 billion we're debating a few halls down. But this is everything that governments are spending as well as private sector in their own businesses. So while it shows a pivot towards greater spending, say by large energy companies in renewables, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that last mile connectivity. And so it is really about how do you connect the capital that is being committed to, the, to kind of how do you take that supply and make it meet the demand. And that is why today on Energy Day, UN Energy is launching the Energy Compact Network, 
Um, and this action network will facilitate and match make between demand side and supply side commitments so that, as Arunaba, you say, the money flows where the sun shines and the wind blows. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanika, um, for driving this action towards this Energy Compact Network. We have just a few minutes left, but I did want to give the floor to uh, someone who could be a demander of the very innovations that you guys are all talking about. So it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, the Environment Minister of Timor-Leste, Mr. Uh, uh, Amaral de Carvalho. Car Sir, what do you learn from this uh, initiative? And would this be something that Timor-Leste could tap into to derive uh, more or drive more investment uh, to derive the renewable energy resources that you have in your country? Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, again, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm very glad to join you uh, in these special sessions on ener renewable energy. Um, talking about renewable energy, uh, we all realize that uh, the center of development is energy. If we choose a better option for a country um, um, to choose uh, a better option for energy supply for a country, uh, the path to uh, net zero will be achieved. Timor-Leste, we have our strategic development uh, plans um, produced back to 2012. We stated that by 2030, we want to achieve, uh, we want to uh, rely on uh, renewable energy 50% uh, of our actual uh, renewable energy or actual energy supply. We have to start with uh, single, uh, with um, small scale uh, solar PV, uh, solar uh, uh, panel system uh, for household level. But uh, we really want to um, um, start uh, to achieve our ambitions to cut our 50% renewable, uh, to uh, switch our uh, uh, fossil-based energy to renewable energy by 2030. Unfortunately, we, uh, we face a reality related to this um, new um, uh, new uh, model of development. Uh, the challenge for, we have uh, faced a um, few challenges such as um, how we attract uh, investor to uh, invest in this field, especially in this the country like Timor-Leste, and also the cost of those technology that can be, um, uh, um, what they call, um, cover by uh, our own resources or um, the investor that want to attract uh, sure. to invest in Timor-Leste. Uh, we have uh, assessed uh, renewable energy potential in Timor-Leste. Uh, we have great from solar, uh, wind to different resources. We have uh, great. The only way to move uh, to that direction is uh, attract investors to come and invest um, in this um, in this field. We have been, I think, in contact with IRENA. I think we're already uh, part of IRENA. We hope uh, we can engage more uh, through IRENA and um, keeping uh, sharing knowledge and uh, lesson learned from other members that uh, have very advanced in this field. I thank you for your attentions. Thank you so much. I do want to give the floor to each one of you for 30 seconds, but I'm going to let give you two minutes to prepare your answers. We have a two-minute video from uh, Mr. Eric Scotto, president of Akuo Energy, about what the private sector wants. If you could have the uh, video up, please, so that and then we can respond to uh, Minister De Carvalho's uh, question of how to attract uh, investors to his country.
Deploying solar power plants in the most energy poor countries is a real mission that we have set ourselves at Haku. This mission has already made success in Mali, but also in Indonesia and the Dominican Republic. These achievements have not been without real difficulties, which are the real challenge for the future of solar in those territories. Developing countries have a significant advantage. They are much more capable of developing a decentralized energy system. This feature raised the question of grid development, but also of our ability to forecast the evolution of power consumption depending on local economic development. These are both constraints and opportunities that hinder the development of solar by generating a disconnection between public funding policies and private companies. Thus, a comprehensive and integrated approach to support governments, design and procure bankable projects with adequate risk mitigation instruments will be a bargain to our sector. We need an approach that offers development and climate financing to help bring the market to maturity, to create efficient feasibility tests and to create safeguards that could mitigate the risk of inconsistent consumption. Thank you. I like that, inconsistent consumption. Um, so you have now the question from the minister, how can we attract invest investors to um, a country like Timor-Leste? So maybe we'll go in reverse order, but 30 seconds. Uh, Kanika. Thank you. I think it's really important to have a coherent set of demands that, that are seeking. What is the pipeline that you are seeking investment for? So what are very, very granular details of what uh, Timor-Leste wants to do year on year on year? What needs to be financed to then do a risk assessment through perhaps an SRMI-like um, initiative or intervention so that private capital can flow into it. But often because we stop at that level of the target and we don't go detailed into what are the set of actions that are required to reach that target, that it, it seems rather nebulous for private investors because it's unclear where the money is exactly going to go. Okay, Kapita, 30 seconds. Well, GCF um, has the unique uh, position to be using its capital, uh, you know, in a very, we are capital agnostic, so we can use our capital in very creative ways. When it comes to, uh, you know, in countries which already have developed markets, SRMI uh, is able to leverage for our $280 million, SRMI is leveraging $5 billion of $1.3 billion in World Bank pro, you know, public uh, funding in grants and loan and as well as private capital. However, we also are able to deploy 100% grants. So for uh, countries that are really poor, uh, what we believe in doing is then sequencing the risks. So we take the most risks if the projects are sequenced properly and that risk then creates the market confidence to follow in a second project, which can be then uh, higher leverage projects and then can de-risk uh, those. So we are able to do both risk sequencing as well as de-risking in the same project. And I think uh, that's the value GCA brings. Francesco. Yes. I think there's no uh, uh, possible in abstract to say what to could be done in this specific situation of, of Timor-Leste. But uh, we are already in contact, uh, so we will continue work and try to identify what could be the best way to work and together with, uh, with our colleagues and allies. So let's try to, to focus, uh, go forward with the work, and uh, we will see what kind of uh, arrangement will be possible. Thank you. We are completely out of time. I simply want to say that the $675 billion that Kanika referred to is less than 4% of the $16 trillion we seem to have mobilized for post-pandemic recovery. We're nowhere near thinking at scale, but as nearly 50 years ago, E.F. Schumacher said, small is beautiful. So if we can driv drive big money to small projects and small countries, then we could have said that we've changed the world. Thank you.
Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. My name is Valérie Poteau, and I'm a delegate general from the French company uh, for electricity. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you for a conference that was organized under the auspices of OECD and ENA, as well as IAEA and uh, ACE. The theme will be how nuclear innovation help reinforcing the complementarities with renewable energies and meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here with me with uh, the French Foreign Affairs Minister, Mr. Le Drian. Mr. Le Drian, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming you here today. Mr. Director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, dear Rafael, thank you for being here. Mr. Director of the International Energy Agency, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to say today is that uh, nuclear energy is, with renewable energies, one of our enablers helping us reach the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which would be curtail global warming to less than one, that two degrees, while continuing our effort to limit it at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're talking about 1.5 uh, deg uh, degrees Celsius, which is what is predictable right now. And nuclear energy is a low carbon, reliable, flexible, a non-intermittent source of energy. And this is why France has become a member of the Nice Future Initiatives and advocates for the uh, nuclear energy to be included in the European taxonomy uh, against a backdrop uh, of uh, an increase in the number of tensions on the uh, energy supply front at the global level, we believe that the nuclear energy is a key factor of energy independence. Indeed, it is uh, an affordable and stable source of, of energy. This is why the President of the French Republic has announced an investment of 1 billion euros in uh, the nuclear energy uh, under the auspices of the Plan France 2030 framework. Nuclear energy helps us uh, reduce uh, our greenhouse gas emissions as well as reinforce our security of uh, su energy supply. And this is a conclusion that a lot of our partners have reached who set up or revive uh, our electro-nuclear program. I would like to take this opportunity to say that France holds dear the effective right of all states to have access to nuclear energy, provided they comply with non-nuclear proliferation. I would also like to say here that France has a high level of technology expertise and a know-how that have been recognized internationally. And this is how we can help and we can control all of our activities on the nuclear sector. And this is how we can help and support the every state who wishes to have access to this type of low carbon energy in the framework of intergovernmental corporations and while complying with the highest standards of uh, safety, security, non-proliferation and environmental protection. This is what I wanted to say today in the name of France. This is what I wanted to say at the beginning of this event, which will look at the role of nuclear in the energy transition and uh, I'm sure that this debate will be an opportunity to take stock of what has been done in this field. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le... Thank you, Minister. And I would like uh, to invite uh, Mr. Raphael Gossi, Director General of uh, the IAEA, to join me here. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Dear friend, uh, Director General of uh, the IA, uh, the fact that uh, the Director General of such a high-level agency sits here next to the Foreign Affairs Minister of France 
I think is very telling. Why? Well, I believe that we are all here faced with a major challenge. It's a common challenge. The conclusions, the scientific facts are clear. Energy, nuclear energy is part of the solution. And this is why, as France already did, I sometimes have to face people who ask me, how can you endeavor to improve low carbon solutions? How can you make sure that you fuel the engine of a powerful and successful energy without damaging the environment? Well, I believe this is the solution. And this is where my agency can contribute. We need to do it in a safe way. We need to do it in a way that will not undermine the environment nor the international security through non-proliferation. French technology is at the forefront of such efforts, and I'm very grateful for efforts carried out by the French society for nuclear energy. In a few weeks, Minister, I will be there in Paris, I believe, with the French president, as well as Mr. Birol, and we will be part of the World Nuclear Exhibition, which is a major event. This will be an opportunity to highlight the fact that this source of energy can be part and parcel in helping us once and for all achieve low carbon uh, economies throughout the world. The IAEA is there with you. It will be supporting this solution to a grave challenge that we are all faced with, including future generations. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mr. Grossi, and it is uh, uh, my honor to invite Mr. Bihal, who is the Director General of the International Energy Agency. My uh, dear friend, uh, uh, Mr. Grossi, uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning uh, to all of you. I would like to start with a, I would say, a good news, a new breaking news. Before COP26, there was a lot of skepticism whether or not something will ever come out of this meeting. And in the last few days, we have seen that several governments made commitments to net zero emissions, and also several governments made commitments of methane emission reductions. So the good news is the following. I ask my colleagues in Paris at our headquarters, if those commitments are fulfilled, what kind of temperature trajectory the world is in line with? And the answer came back this morning. If those commitments are fulfilled, including those made in the last few days, including, for example, very important of India and the others, the world temperature increase is 1.8 degrees Celsius. This is a good news. This is a good news. It's an encouraging news. It doesn't mean that the problem is solved. It doesn't mean that the, those commitments will be fulfilled, but this is a very important signal to the rest of the world. And as such, I believe Paris, where I am happy to live, where the Paris Accord is made and Glasgow are getting closer to each other, which I believe is something that we should all be happy about. This is number one. Number two news I want to give you about nuclear. Again, the recent developments. The world is going through some difficult times in terms of energy markets volatility. Price of natural gas, price of coal, oil are going up. And we can discuss what the reasons are if you wish. But one of the unintended positive consequences of this market volatility 
has been some people have understand reappreciated the value of nuclear power this is something that we all need to take a, a, a note of some people in the countries where nuclear power is only an established energy source the citizens have understood the value of such having a reliable low cost and zero emission source of energy so this recent developments i believe gave a support to uh, appreciation or reappreciation of the value of uh, nuclear power ladies and gentlemen last may international energy agency published a report net zero roadmap everybody is using this net zero roadmap from the uh, the black rocks to the governments from governments to industry and i was very happy that the climate community embraced our report very good news for international energy agency a small organization in paris but one of the facts in that report is in my view very pertinent in order to reach our energy and climate goals nuclear generation needs to double compared to today we expect the renewables to grow efficiency to grow hydrogen to grow electric cars to grow but nuclear power generation needs to double if we were to reach our energy and climate uh, goals i would like to note here that the, we believe nuclear power has an integral role to play if we are serious to address our climate uh, challenges dear colleagues let me finish my words when i look at the nuclear world with three tasks i think we have in front of us in terms of uh, nuclear power number one very important in the country where i live france or uh, united states and in japan lifetime extensions many nuclear power plants if you extend the lifetime with the right safety measures and the, the, under the uh, auspices of the regulatory bodies it is one of the cheapest source of clean electric generation lifetime extensions i discussed this with the u.s government with japanese government and with my uh, french colleagues this is number one second new builds i think if again if people believe our net zero roadmap which seems that the people are believing in our net zero roadmap around the world we have to increase the pace of new builds of nuclear power plants by a factor of five huge increase and it is not only from one country today china is dominating the new builds around the world but we would like to see from europe north america from asia and uh, elsewhere this is, I think, another important area that we need to look. And the third area is the nuclear innovation. I think here uh, it is important that the nuclear industry also needs to renew itself. We see many new technologies coming, and we would like to see that the, uh, the nuclear technology renews itself, nuclear industry renews itself, and here, a special emphasis I would like to give the small modular reactors, which is when we look at the challenges that the countries are facing, could be one of the solutions. And as my uh, friend Mr. Grossi mentioned, I am looking forward to discuss this in the World uh, Nuclear Exhibition uh, the, the opened by the uh, President Macron on 30th of November in Paris. Many thanks and have a nice day. Thank you. Um, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Donc, je vous invite maintenant. I'm going to now invite you to watch a video. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. I am now going to show you a video from Mrs. Agnès Panier-Runacher, who is the uh, industry minister. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward toward the 2050 carbon neutrality objective, the magnitude of this ambition and the urgency to address it with the fullest extent through a renewed partnership between governments, private actors and the civil society become every day clearer. The European Union has set itself at the forefront of climate action with an upscale ambition set forward in the Fit for 55 package and a long-standing commitment to meet this challenge. France, as a country of the Paris Agreement, fully intends to play a leading part in this effort. Understanding what carbon neutrality by 2050 means is fundamental to design adequately policy option. Two years ago, as we included this target as a core directive of our energy public policy national law, the French government tasked the national TSO with a mission to provide an unprecedented report detailing the different options to meet this challenge and an outlook as to their social, technical, and economical consequences. Following the release of the report last week on October 24th, I believe a few key takeaways should be shared as an introduction to your exchange today. First, there is no decarbonization without a substantial increase of electricity consumption gating to net zero without any energy efficiency effort implies almost doubling the national demand of electricity at 845 TWh compared to around 430 TWh today. Even a prolonged effort in energy efficiency only brings the reference scenario at around plus 50% compared to today's consumption, and pushing further needs sobriety, that is, consent to substantially adapt our mode of consumption, and if need be, decrease the comfort we are used to. It would be environmentally unsound, socially unacceptable, and economically unwise to keep reducing the national emissions without taking care of our footprint. For too long, we have failed to address the carbon leakage issue. Redeveloping low carbon productions closer to the consumer, leveraging the low carbon footprint of our power systems will be fundamental components of our climate ambitions. If we want to decarbonize our economy while acknowledging this issue and to maintain a substantial share of industry in the national output at around 13% of the GDP, we are looking at a 35% increase in power consumption. This brings me to the second point. If we want to meet this challenge of a substantially higher power consumption, we need to rely on all low carbon energies in a technologically neutral approach. The climate emergency does not have the luxury of ideology. We should not discriminate between valid technologies when they all contribute to the same fundamental objective, bringing forward the much needed low carbon electricity we will need to meet the 2050 neutrality challenge. Back in 2018, Researchers at MIT found that supporting renewable energy with a mix of clean energy solutions, including nuclear, would make carbon-free electricity up to 62% cheaper than using renewables alone. This demonstration was proven once again true in the context of the French electricity system by our TSO RTE. In that regard, the inclusion of nuclear as well as renewable is a fundamental element of the credibility of sustainable finance regulations, such as the European taxonomy. The French government, along with a broad coalition of member states, look forward to the European Commission finalizing in the coming weeks this major legislative element that will pave the way for better involvement of private capital 
in the fight on climate change. Finally, my third point is that we need to keep an open mind to innovation. To quote Bill Gates, with innovations in nuclear power, we can create a new generation of nuclear energy that would be safer, produce less waste, and be lower cost. To make this innovation a reality, we need governments to step up and commit new funding for nuclear energy research and demonstrate that there is a future for nuclear energy. France has already stepped up. We put forward half a billion euros in the France Relance National Recovery Plan as a token to our resolve in building a future for nuclear energy. These funds were both dedicated to modernize the sector's industrial capabilities and to prepare its future, including funding SMR projects. France 2030, the investment plan recently unveiled by President Macron, will push forward this effort with 1 billion euro for the nuclear sector and that developing innovative technologies and supporting a flourishing ecosystem of new actors in the field. We will be particularly attentive to ensure that this funding effort be open to all technologies and to all European partnerships in keeping with the spirit of the Euratom Treaty. To conclude, I would like to quote, to quote the 1953 address at the UN General Assembly by President Eisenhower. Peaceful power from atomic energy is the dream of the future. The capability already proved is here today. Who can doubt that if the entire body of the world's scientists and engineers had adequate amounts with which to test and develop their ideas, this capability would rapidly be transformed into universal, efficient and economic usage. What was true 70 years ago is even more so today, and this is the future we have to build together. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Pagny-Runache, uh, Ministry of uh, Industry. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Laurent Michel, Director of, uh, for Energy and Climate within the Ministry of Environment. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thanks to the uh, Nuclear Energy uh, agency from uh, from France for organizing this event and inviting me to uh, give some technical insights. Well, my proposal would be the following. Before we jump into details about hydrogen innovation and nuclear energy, let's talk about decarbonization and say why we are talking now about electricity in, the, in regard of French policies. As far as France is concerned, as the minister said, we are strongly committed towards decarbonization, but what we think it relies on massive policies and a decarbonization, a growing decarbonization of the energy sector. There is biomass, there is, no, there is biogas, but there are also lots of other leverages around electricity both direct and through hydrogen, with direct electrification, the first things first, with the development of electric transport uh, on the roads, with uh, mobility, with the evolution of industrial processes, with uh, some kinds of uh, efficient heating systems, with uh, a shift in that matter. And there is also the arrival, the uh, uprising, the gro a growing one of hydrogen technologies in order to decarbonize the e existing usage of hydro hydrogen within the industry and modify processes in, in, um, iron, in the iron works. And hydrogen, uh, I heard, if it is decarbonized, is a flexibility solution for the electricity system. 
the electricity production system in order to produce uh, decarbonized hydrogen there are several ways we think that the electrolyzed way uh, upon a, a decarbonized electricity is one of the ways uh, this is a, a chance we have and we, we, we should grow build upon that and that could be a mean thinking uh, we have to be efficient in terms of quantity but also in terms of cost which doesn't mean that there are no other ways to produce decarbonized electricity but when it comes to our hydrogen strategies that is this is a, a one of the priorities the government alway already paved the way um, with its strategy uh, published in 2020 identifying a clear prospect of the upgrading of the consumption of electricity. By the way, you've probably noticed, if you follow the news when it comes to French energy, that after the, the, uh, the demand of the French government, our transport network has published about a week ago, October 25th, a study called Ener Energy to, uh, um, 2050 paving uh, numerous ways about consu consumption. We, we have first assessments. Uh, they've been done, they've been performed a couple of years ago. So if you, if you take out the COVID effects, we have around 50 tera terawatts per hour, and it, it would, should be in 2050, 650 terawatts per hour. So we'll, we have to raise our efforts in terms of energy efficiency, but other factors will, will also make us make, create the need to go beyond this objective in terms of carbon footprints, putting more hydrogen into mobility. Uh, and that could bring us to more uh, to LTE visions with uh, perhaps 750 terawatts per hour in 2050, which means uh, things would go faster than we, we would have thought a couple of years ago ago when we were, we were imagining a kind of stability until 2050. So the RTE study, and bro broadly speaking, all the, the studies that have been performed show that facing this, uh, this challenge, uh, taking into account the uh, production tools we have nowadays and the needs we have and we are going to have, it's already decarbonated to uh, a great extent thanks to nuclear energy, but we'll still need to make this production capacity higher and to update it because a, a huge part of our production tools are uh, getting obsolete. Many of our nuclear plants are quite old and uh, that means this need will go, um, will grow and we have to grow our production uh, capacity and since things take time in terms of uh, technolo te technolo technological development, we have to start working very soon. What RTE is saying, basically, that we, we should remember a couple of things. Uh, we will certainly need to grow our, to, to develop our production capacities and take some parts when it comes to nuclear, to put more nuclear energy and more, new, more renewable energy in our energy mix. Uh, I don't know, I won't be saying now when and how much, but there has to be a huge increase. This is what RT has drew our uh, attention upon. Uh, on the mid-run, there is a risk of execu uh, an execution risk uh, because of uh, technological barriers, because of the... Uh, because of the demand, because of the feasibility, because whatever the scenario uh, would be, growing capacities generates more risks. RT is always are also saying that if should the um, prolongations that we already practice, because we're, we're, we're talking about 40 years now, it's 50 years, so some uh, nuclear plants have to uh, will work longer than they were, were supposed to, but it does. It's not enough, and it bears a risk as well, because you you could have safety risk, industrial risks as well, which means that making the nuclear plants l ever longer is not a riskless option, which asks us yet another question about the relevancy of the uh, decisions when it comes to our. Newer, newest nuclear programs are 
concerned, but that's not my, the aim of my, uh, <coughs> my keynote today. So when it, uh, about innovation, in order to illustrate, would be better illustrated by the other speakers today, but in order to build upon what has been said by the French government in terms of uh, uh, supporting innovation, uh, I'd talk about hydrogen. A uh, strategy has been adopted in September 2020. It will last a couple of years. It implies a couple of billion euros, and I think it is feasible. Six gigawatts of electrolyze in 2030 compared to a couple of dozens today. So it would be 600,000 tons that would be decarbonated already. That's already a huge part. And that we could ask new hydrogen to the cycle faster than, than, we, than we'd thought. Soutien à l'innovation, le développement des briques technologiques de la chaîne de valeur, comme réservoir, pile à combustible, électrolyseur de, de, de haute performance. Et Electrolyzers and by big projects, uh, transborder very often, uh, projects of uh, common pro interest. Seeing the dynamics and the needs of the government in the framework of its uh, innovation plan called France 2030, 2030, France 2030, it's a second plan, not uh, short term, but uh, something uh, for the long term. We decided to uh, to put 1.6 billion uh, euro to um, to help the uh, hydrogen projects and the development of uh, territorial um, projects. First uh, restarting plan, these projects are uh, ongoing, as has been decided, uh, and will be uh, implemented by companies together with uh, uh, institutions, research institution, institution uh, a big number of euros uh, for the competitivity in terms of innovation, digital innovation of uh, added value and the performance of uh, an industry, maintaining the competences. We, we realized that the competences uh, had this appears this uh, here and there, but we want also to help uh, the innova innovating uh, methods of uh, treatment of the première étape de appeler avant waste. Uh, also, the small uh, SMR uh, nuclear reactors. The, plan, the innovation plan called the France 2030 decided to amplify this help to the innovation to, for, to, for the nuclear. Um, we're talking here about 1 billion euro uh, to, uh, to accompany the, uh, the consortium SMR up till the uh, pre preliminary project, uh, detailed one, to, to conduct all the necessary works. So the, these new uh, nominal reactors can be an option for us. Uh, so prototypes can be functional uh, in the 2030s, then to become an option for construction in France and uh, abroad in the next um, years. This will not be that can only to follow the project, but also to um, to calls for projects on. Uh, uh, on new reactors and on management of uh, waste. So this, these two plans uh, mean a very strong support to the operational performance of the, of the sector in the short run, which will be necessary to prolongate the, 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 the park and for the future nuclear program, but also for the uh, future innovation stages. I will end by saying that uh, uh, my time uh, is finishing this, this, this plan um, to France 2030 is dedicated, uh, dedicates uh, big money to, um, to limit the, um, well, actually to decarbonate the industry, whether it's uh, cement plants or uh, chemical plants, and of course, uh, hydrogen electrification of the process and the industrialization of the renewal, renewable energy of the, around the, uh, w the thread mills and um, the windmills and uh, others, solar.
projects. So we uh, count more than ever on the innovation and its uh, div and, and, and its uh, deployment uh, and around the sectors and their complementarity. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It is my honor to start now our discussion panel uh, concerning these innovations. And it's indeed a great honor to invite here on stage Ms. Diane Cameron, Head of Nuclear Technology at the OECD NEA, Mr. Henri Payer, IAHA Head Planning of Economic Studies, Mr. Laurent Anthony, and for Mr. Paul Spence, EDF Energy Head of Strategic Analysis and Modeling. Very much for the four of you uh, to be here. So we're going to talk about innovations uh, in nuclear that can uh, drive synergies with renewables to reach our uh, carbon goals. So we're going to talk a lot about first um, how the scenarios see uh, nuclear um, in the decarbonization scenarios. Then we also will discuss uh, the innovation in uh, SMRs, in advanced modular reactors. We will also discuss um, the fact that nuclear can decarbonize not only by providing low carbon electricity, but also by providing low carbon heat and low carbon hydrogen, which is very important. And then uh, finally, we'll talk also a lot. We have lots of questions about adaptation. Uh, so our, I think our experts are, uh, um, are able, of course, to answer your questions about adaptation. I forgot a very important factor, of course, is um, one of the key uh, uh, requirements for nuclear to operate in uh, uh, networks with a high percentage of renewables, which is the flexibility of a nuclear fleet enable really to operate in this type of uh, energy systems. So first, I think we're going to start uh, uh, with Diane and I will leave you the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'd like to thank our hosts, uh, the French government and our co-organizers from SFEN, CEA, IAEA, and my own home organization, the OECD NEA. So following that alphabet soup, let's dive in. <laughs> It's my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, the head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the NEA, and I'd like to share with you some of our new analysis. Next slide, please. Or is that something I control myself? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with a little bit of context situating today's discussion about nuclear innovation for a net zero future against the backdrop of the conference, against the backdrop of the climate emergency and the ambition of net zero by 2050 before turning to small modular reactors and nuclear hybrid energy systems, including uh, nuclear hydrogen, uh, and then closing with remarks about uh, nuclear here at COP26. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the context because you all know it very, very well. Um, the mounting climate crisis is one of the defining, if not the defining challenge for this generation. And that message has been amp amplified and echoed here in Glasgow um, just to say that the magnitude of the problem really shouldn't be underestimated. Next slide, please. I will spend a little bit of time talking about pathways. Next slide, please. About pathways. Various organizations, and it is such an honor to be here following uh, the distinguished speakers from the IAEA and the IEA and the French Ministry and French government. Um, various organizations, including the IEA, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, as well as Shell and BP, amongst others, have published pathways to show us how to get from where we are today to net zero by 2050. 
And there are a lot of these published pathways out there. The IPCC, that is of course the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, did a review of 90 different pathways that notionally show us how we might get from where we are today to net zero by 2050. And despite the large number of published pathways though, there remains a significant amount of uncertainty. Uncertainty around the technical feasibility, uncertainty about the political will, and uncertainty about the costs of actually achieving those goals. Many of the published pathways depend on energy technology innovations that are in the works but not yet commercially available such as widespread CCUS and an integrated hydrogen economy. It is notable though, bringing it to nuclear innovation, it is really notable that none, and I do mean none, of the 90 published pathways to net zero depend heavily on nuclear innovation. Some are ambitious in terms of the extent of nuclear buildup that they call for. Dr. Fatih Biral just a moment ago quoted a pathway that calls for a doubling of nuclear installed capacity by 2050. We've looked at the 90 pathways and on average, in fact, they call for a tripling of global installed nuclear capacity by 2050. Now, that's based on commercially existing available in the publications, the, the, the absence of a conversation on nuclear innovation in these pathways represents both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a gap in the conversation, but it also is an opportunity because we know in the nuclear sector that nuclear innovation has the potential to deliver so much more. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Let's turn to the next slide, please. Let's start with SMRs, small modular reactors. For those of you for whom this is a new topic, it's just what the name suggests. They're smaller, both in terms of their physical size and their power output, anything less than 300 megawatts electric. They're modular, meaning they're designed to be factory produced, in some cases even portable and scalable. And they are nuclear reactors, which means at the middle of these things somewhere is a nuclear fission reaction that generates heat. What's interesting about that is you can use that heat directly for industrial applications or you can always use it to drive a turbine and create electricity. They also provide a number of other benefits, building on decades of experience, introducing new safety features, enhanced and simplified safety that some people in the industry call passive safety or inherent safety. They also, follow fle they also offer flexibility. This is in particular important, it's a theme throughout the conference, the flexibility to load, follow and back up variable renewables with applications on grid and off grid. Next slide, please. A key point to understand is that small modular reactors, it's one term, but it covers a class of reactors at various sizes and various temperatures, ranging from one as small as one megawatt electric, so that's a micro reactor, uh, all the way up to 300 megawatts electric, which has grid scale applications, temperatures ranging from 285 degrees Celsius up to 850 degrees Celsius. What we've got on this scatter plot, I'm sorry, you're one slide ahead of me. Could we go back one slide, please? What we've got on this scatter plot are some of the near term SMRs. So, SMRs that we expect that will be commercially available within five to ten years. Not all of these will succeed because the market will, will down select and some of them will come uh, to success, but you can see a range of sizes and a range of temperatures. We've also put on the graph some of the industrial sectors that need heat, paper at the low end of the temperature scale, soda ash, chemicals, ammonia, refineries, aluminum, steam methane reforming. These are industries that are very difficult to abate. It is very inefficient to turn electricity back into heat. And so right now, most of these sectors depend on combined heat and power from fossil energy. So even in a renewables first strategy, there is still a gap. There are still industrial sectors that need heat to decarbonize and SMRs can play a role there. Turning to the next slide, please, briefly, another exciting area of nuclear innovation 
is nuclear-produced hydrogen. There is momentous interest around the world in the potential of hydrogen solutions to climate change. But hydrogen only has the potential to contribute to decarbonization strategies under two conditions. One, it has to be produced from low carbon sources. And two, the production of hydrogen cannot crowd out decarbonization of other parts of the energy sector, for example, by competing for low carbon electricity where that supply is limited. So turning to my next slide on hydrogen, we're going to hear more about hydrogen from Laurent Anthony, chair of the Hydrogen Europe research. So I won't spend too much time on this, just to say that nuclear power has unique features that are very well suited to the production of hydrogen, low emitting, low carbon hydrogen. It is a low cost source of electricity. We heard from Dr. Biral, who presented the results of joint IEA, NEA work that finds that life extension or long term operations of nuclear power is the the lowest cost, low carbon source of electricity. Nuclear power also provides high capacity factors, which is important for driving down the costs of low carbon hydrogen. And nuclear power can unlock, this is important, gigawatt scale production of hydrogen through economies of scale. And we're going to need a lot of hydrogen in almost every scenario and pathway to net zero. Turning to the next slide, I only have three more slides, I think. I'd like, and I'll go pretty quickly, I'd like to share with you the results of new analysis by the Nuclear Energy Agency that begins to project and quantify the full potential of nuclear energy to contribute to net zero by 2050 in our new work, and there's some flyers on the tables that you can take with you when you go. In our new work, we find that taken together, nuclear electricity, nuclear heat, and nuclear hydrogen from a combination of existing technologies that are already commercially available and near-term nuclear innovation such as small modular reactors can displace up to 87 gigatons of carbon dioxide between 2020 and 2050. And that's including 23 gigatons from innovations that we talked about today, small modular reactors for heat and hydrogen. Next slide, please. This slide shows the same data but a different view with contributions from long-term operations of existing fleets in blue, new builds of large-scale reactors in orange, and small modular reactors in yellow. What we've stacked are conservative and ambitious or aspirational scenarios for nuclear through these three technologies. And the red line shows you the cumulative emissions that would be avoided between 2020 and 2050. There's one more, piece of in, one more piece of information that's really important on this graph. That's the green line, 1,160 gigawatts of nuclear capacity by 2050. That's what the average IPCC pathway to net zero requires. On average, we have to triple global installed nuclear capacity from where we are today, which is about 393 gigawatts of nuclear capacity, to 1,160. We've started referring to that essentially as our target. The nuclear sector has a target. If you want to play your role in reaching net zero, this is your target. It's an ambitious scenario. It is ambitious. And when we first saw that target, honestly, we were discouraged. We thought, holy guacamole, how are we going to get from where we are today to a tripling in 30 years? And then we started to do the piecewise analysis. We started to project conservative and ambitious approaches to LTO, that's long-term operations, to generation three new builds, that's existing reactor technology new builds, and then SMRs. And we actually, almost by coincidence, found pathways to that target. Now, next slide, please. This is my last slide, I think. Before we all sigh a sigh of relief and declare success, let's take a little bit of a closer look. On this graph, we show you the planned projects in blue and orange. And in gray, we show you the gap. The gap is between what's currently planned, effectively what we can, plan, we can count on with some confidence. And you see the gap between what we need and what we're planning. It becomes really evident between 2030 and 2050. Because of the timelines for nuclear projects, we need to act now. 
We need decisions by governments and industry now to close that gap because it is achievable, but it requires to change our plans to be more ambitious. I lied, there's one final slide really fast, guys. COP, our hosts here in Glasgow set out five themes to structure our discussions this week. And I'd like to just share with you and encourage you to think about how nuclear can cut across all five themes and support priorities across all five themes. It is clean energy, we know that. It's a low carbon source of electricity, but it can also support clean transport by producing low carbon synthetic fuels and hydrogen. It supports nature-based solutions because it has a very low environmental footprint in terms of land density, air and water, and in terms of dependence on critical minerals. It supports priorities on adaptation and resilience. I think others are going to talk about that. My colleague Michelle uh, Berthelemy provided a presentation earlier today on the readiness of the nuclear sector for adaptation. And lastly, on climate finance for all the reasons we've talked about here today. I encourage you to speak out on this issue because nuclear should be front and center in discussions about taxonomies, climate finance, development finance, environmental social governance, ESG finance. Thank you so much. It was a privilege to be here. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Diane. So we're going to give the floor to Laurent Anthony, who is president of Hydrogen Research Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Valérie, and uh, also thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm maybe just waiting for the slides. <laughs> yes. Well, next slide, please. So um, I will continue to speak about hydrogen. It has been mentioned several times by Dan, by, by the ministers, by the different directors before. And it's a really fast evolving context. And uh, also, uh, of course, hydrogen has only sense if it is low carbon and decarbonized hydrogen. This has also been mentioned pr many times. But we'll see also the complementary approaches to produce this renewable and low carbon hydrogen. And nuclear electricity is one of these solutions. Next slide, please. Next slide. So it's a really fast evolving context. Uh, as you can see, hydrogen can be considered as a second leg of the energy transition. You have on one side electricity, on the other side hydrogen. And uh, what also we can say today, and now we have seen ministers speaking about hydrogen and different plans, that now also we are moving from momentum to actions. And actions at the political level, more and more countries have developed their own hydrogen strategy, but also industry is also now moving in really big projects with really high level of private investments and public private investments. And finally, we. Nobody can develop hydrogen alone. This really needs an international collaboration. And here also we can see there are more and more as we, organizations working on hydrogen, IEA, IRENA, but also now the, uh, interna the International Intergovernmental uh, Partnership on Hydrogen, IPHE, uh, where we are really discussing all together how can we develop as fast as possible clean and renewable hydrogen. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. And why do we have to develop hydrogen? As you can see here, and Dr. Birol just mentioned uh, hydrogen previously, there is just the Global Review Hydrogen Review released some weeks ago. And here you see the projection of hydrogen demand by 2050. Uh, from uh, today, or a little less than 100 million tons of hydrogen, we expect to have six, full, six times more hydrogen to be produced by 2050. And by 2030, you can see we almost have to double the amount of hydrogen. And now how can we produce that hydrogen? And also following the same IEA report, uh, we see that we need to develop the, electricity, the hydrogen produced by electricity. And this is exactly also what has just been mentioned by uh, Mr. Laurent Michel previously, that in order to produce hydrogen using electricity, electrolysis is the main way to pr produce that. And here we really need innovations in order to have high efficiency, low cost, high durability. And here really research has to 
work with industry in order to, to develop really very high technology of a different kind of electrolysis. Next slide, please. And I was just mentioning it's a fast evolving context. Here you just see, following, I would say, the already ongoing project or announced projects, the evolution of the low carbon and renewable hydrogen over the last two years. And you see that in two years, the vision by 2030 has just grown by fivefold. So, uh, and we hope that with all these strategies, all these plans, even this number will next year be higher and higher. And we really need to have this renewable and low carbon hydrogen. And if you remember the slide before where we mentioned 200 million tons by 2030 expected, here at 11, it's, it's only 5%. So we need really to increase the way to produce low carbon and renewable hydrogen. So next slide, please. But at the same time, it's, we also need to ensure the society that the hydrogen you are producing is beneficial toward the climate change. And here, exactly, we also need to demonstrate the transparency of the market, which means that really we need to demonstrate to the society that the hydrogen now we are producing is low carbon. And from that point of view, carbon content of the hydrogen produced becomes really the pivotal parameter. Next slide, please. So how can we now produce this uh, these hydrogen? Next slide, please. There are different approaches. And I just wanted to show this map where you can see that following the region where you are, some regions are really focused on producing renewable hydrogen, like, for instance, the European Union. Other countries, like you see North America or Russia, they are also open to produce low carbon hydrogen using fossil uh, fuel with carbon capture usage and sequestration. So, and other countries, regions are using both. And uh, that's why there is no single solution. We need to respect, and nuclear as well, yes, as low carbon uh, hydrogen. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and. Uh, just to show that there is no single solution, we need all energies, fossil with CCUS, nuclear to have low carbon hydrogen, and of course to increase the power of renewable energy to produce hydrogen. And depending on the region, uh, it will vary, and that's why we really need to see all these different solutions as complementary, not as competitive. The idea is really how to to follow and to answer the, the request of producing huge amount of decarbonized hydrogen. Next slide, please. And then it has also to be cost competitive. And here following the Hydrogen Council uh, uh, figures of, this, of earlier this year, you see also that even if we are producing this low carbon and new hydrogen, it will become cost competitive. Not today, but you see between 25 and 30, 35, this low carbon and renewable hydrogen will become competitive with regard to the fossil hydrogen, where we also have then to pay for CO2 taxes. So that's why it's so important, and that's why we see today this momentum shifting into actions. Next slide, please. And then another question is, not all the countries will be able to produce the hydrogen domestically. And so that's why some countries have also in mind to import renewable hydrogen in their own country. But if we have that strategy, we also need to have in mind that it may have an impact on the hydrogen cost, but also the hydrogen carbon footprint, where we just mentioned previously. So that's why it may have a carbon footprint until we are developing zero emission ships, which is also one innovation uh, in the hydrogen community we're working on. Next slide, please. And so what about producing low carbon hydrogen using nuclear uh, electricity. And here you see three supplementary solutions, short term, mid term and long term. Short term is just as mentioned previously by many speakers, we just have to use the electricity produced from nuclear plants ongoing. And using that, we can just use the electrolyzers we already have developed, either low temperature electrolyzers or uh, mainly, which are mature and commercial today. And here, the advantage is you do, not, you do not have to develop a hydrogen network, gas network, because you can just use the existing grid to produce the hydrogen where you will consume it, for instance, mainly in industry. Second option is 
in addition to that, in the medium term, is then to use a direct coupling between re nuclear reactors and nuclear plants and electrolyzers. And here you see that's for generation three or SMR, where by design, you can directly have a direct connection using the coolant circuit in order to have on one side electricity, but also the heat you may need to develop a new innovative electrolysis mode, which is the high temperature electrolysis. And just to give you an idea, the difference is you may save, save between 15 and 20% of efficiency by moving from low temperature electrolysis to high temperature electrolysis. This is just because you are using heat uh, and you, are, you need less electricity to produce the same amount of hydrogen than using low, 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 low temperature electrolysis. And finally, another way, but that's for more for long term, is when developing generation four reactors at very high temperatures. Here we can directly use the high temperature also for the high, uh, by, uh, by thermal, thermal, uh, thermal chemical cycles uh, at very high temperature. So here you see there are three complementary approaches with different agenda, time frame, but all of them can really uh, facilitate uh, the, produ the massive production of low carbon hydrogen. And maybe just next slide to give some uh, specificities of this coupling between nuclear plant and high temperature electrolysis. As you can see, we can use at the same time the electricity produced by the nuclear plant, but also the heat, the heat used by the coolant circuit. And how with that, you have all in place uh, nuclear uh, electricity, heat, and you have your high temperature electrolysis. And then you are producing really massively low carbon hydrogen. And in the time frame, it's, I would say that it's working well together as in this medium term when SMR will be developed. At the same time, high temperature electrolysis will also become major at the gigawatt level. And so they will merge and I would say come at the same point at the same time. And then to finalize, to come to the conclusion, next slide please, is to say that as you can see, hydrogen can be considered as the second leg. Of the, of the energy transition with electricity, that now the hydrogen, the momentum is shifting to actions for the hydrogen community. And all low carbon, all low carbon energies, including nuclear, are needed to produce the fast increasing demand of hydrogen in order to significantly contribute to our decarbonization goals. And speaking about nuclear, you just have seen that there is not one way, but there are three different approaches of using this uh, low carbon hydrogen and with different time frame. And so I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laurence. Now I would like uh, to give a floor to uh, a nuclear operator, uh, EDF Energy. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for being with us. And I'd like you to give your vision as an operator of where you see uh, uh, first, you know, as we have a higher percentage of renewables on the electricity system, how do you manage it? And what is the contribution of uh, nuclear in uh, such uh, high renewable systems? And uh, also your view on the adaptation work that's being done in DDF today and finally a view on uh, hydrogen as an opportunity for the nuclear fleet and future nuclear reactors. Now, can you hear? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Valerie, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to speak on behalf of EDF Energy, the UK nuclear operator part of the EDF group. And I'm slightly daunted to follow such illustrious speakers that we've, we've heard today talking about it. But I'd like to give, if I may, the industrial perspective of uh, a company that is doing nuclear today. Uh, the first thing I'd say is it's very positive to see the recognition of the important role that nuclear is already playing in decarbonisation. And, and if I may, I would just like to note that in the UK, on Monday the 1st, we celebrated the fact that our nuclear fleet had 
over its lifetime produced 2,000 terawatt hours of zero carbon electricity during the production phase. And that's enough to power the whole of the UK households for over 18 years. So nuclear is here and it's already providing that. I think, if I may, alongside that, I mean, it was interesting to, to hear Diane talk about some of the gaps in the conversation around nuclear. And that's what I'd like to focus on, if I may, today, is some of the gaps that exist in the way that we are talking and thinking about nuclear. And the first one is the misperception that nuclear is an inflexible technology. Uh, the reality, particularly illustrated in France, is that nuclear works very well alongside renewables, alongside the, you know, the weather-dependent technologies of wind and solar, and it has been doing that for 35 years already. The stations in France, as they are asked to by Artea, the nuclear operator, are able to change during the course of a single day by about 30% of the production during that day. So in some cases from f nearly 50 terawatt hours of, or terawatt, sorry, of production capacity during the day, turning down to 33 terawatts and therefore allowing the wind capacity or the solar capacity to produce, but then also coming back up during that same day to respond as the weather-dependent technologies are not producing. So nuclear is already flexible, and it's done that as a result of technical innovation work in the 80s by EDF and Framatome to make sure that the reactors are set to do it without consequence for their lifetime, for their safety, for their emissions, and with the right training for the operators. So I think first thought for you all is nuclear is already flexible and is very well suited to be providing those same flexibility services alongside wind and alongside solar and alongside hydro in the global future energy system. And it's very good to see that being recognized by um, Fatih Birol and the, the, the teams in IEA and at my level teams in the UK who have also recognized that that important contribution nuclear can play. The, the second gap I would I was observe is that at times people talk about um, nuclear as being only able to support the hydrogen economy in the longer term and it was very good to hear Laurent talk about the shorter term role that nuclear can play and um, in I mean if I can give an example we at the moment are um, on the back of build the successful restart of the UK nuclear program where we're building the first nuclear station in a generation at Hinkley Point C we are talking with the UK government about the possibility of a second project using the, sa the same engineering design. And for that project at Sizewell, which the government this week talked uh, positively about their intent to, to take forward, we are already looking at the contribution that that gigawatt scale reactor can make to the delivery of a new hydrogen economy. And we're thinking about that in two, maybe three parts. The first part is we are thinking about the role that nuclear construction can play in creating demand for hydrogen. You know, we know that to construct a nuclear power station, a gigawatt scale station, involves at peak 10,000 people working on the site, involves enormous movement of earth. Those people, that earth movement, needs to be done in a low carbon way if we're going to minimize the impact on the planet. And therefore, looking at hydrogen powered transport, hydrogen buses, hydrogen construction vehicles as the first stage of creating demand for hydrogen. And we can generate that hydrogen that we need by coupling 
an electrolyzer with the existing nuclear station that is already sited at Sizewell. So uh, Laurent talked about that, the idea of electrolysis. We are also already thinking about the design of that reactor for, for Sizewell that will be a copy of the Hinkley Point design, but with the adjustment that we will put in valves to, to take out some of the steam before it is used to generate electricity. And we can take out a small amount of steam less than 5% of the total steam produced without changing the design of the reactor or changing the design of the conventional generation part of the plant. We can yet then use that steam for two potential options. One option is, as Laurent, Laurent talked about, to create a basis for more efficient high temperature electrolysis. So using that steam to reduce the cost of hydrogen that could then be used because we've started in a hydrogen economy locally. The other thing that we're looking at that steam to be used for, and we're, we're exploring again the technical feasibility and the economic feasibility, is to use that heat to support direct air capture, which again requires heat as part of doing it efficiently. So nuclear can then become part of taking hydrogen, sorry, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and creating a, not just a low carbon solution, but a negative carbon solution from the housing of a nuclear power station and the capabilities that it produces. So in the near term, we're already on with those things. And then, again, to, to play back what Laurent was talking about, we are also then looking about the longer-term options of the way that heat from future large but also small-scale reactors could be used more actively as part of powering industry, powering air capture, and powering even more hydrogen production. And so I'll, I will stop there with the message that these are not long-term options. These are things that nuclear is already doing and capable of doing today. And I'm afraid I have to apologize. I'm, I have another panel, which means that I have to leave now, having done a very quick brain dump of what we're already doing here in the UK. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, so we have a last speaker, so uh, Henri, uh, I will uh, leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, thank you, Valérie. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Valérie, and thank you uh, for the French, to the French uh, uh, Nuclear uh, uh, Society for organizing the event uh, here at COP. Um, and uh, I would like to take the opportunity of this uh, event to uh, share with you some of the key messages from uh, a publication we released a couple of weeks ago called Nuclear Energy for a Net Zero World. And I'll try to um, walk you through that publication and illustrate how, um, uh, and that's the topic of, of, of the session, how nuclear and renewables uh, uh, can work together to, to help uh, countries meet their uh, net zero objectives. Next slide, please. So the, the questions, uh, uh, Fatih Birol introduced uh, um, their, his pub the publication from the International Energy Agency from, from, from May, uh, that uh, a roadmap to net zero. So the, the question we wanted to, to answer was, uh, what, what is the, the role of nuclear in that transition to net zero? Um, uh, in electricity, but also beyond electricity, and what do uh, these net zero uh, targets mean for, for nu uh, nuclear power? So in uh, uh, Diane's uh, presentation, there are different pathways to, to, to net zero. Um, Fatih Birol explained that in, in the IEA net zero scenario, there's a, at least a doubling of nuclear capacity. That's what we found in our own uh, projections. These are not scenarios, but pr projections. Um, so at, at least the message is that uh, uh, we will need a, l a lot of electricity, that's for sure, 
and at least twice the amount of uh, nuclear electricity uh, to get to net zero by, by, by the middle of the century. Uh, one important question, very topical here at COP, is how nuclear, can, nuclear energy can help displace the use of fossil fuels and coal in particular, and uh, why investing in nuclear makes sense in, in, in this post-COVID uh, recovery and the transition to clean energy systems. So that's our, 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 our publication. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, it, it's available online if you want to, 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 uh, to, to download it. And I'll, I'll walk you through the, the key message from the main chapters. Next slide, please. So uh, w um, moving away from coal, um, this is uh, uh, an important, uh, uh, it's a vital for, for the world to, uh, to move away from, from fossil fuel if, if we want to, to reach net zero. Um, Having a lot of electricity from nuclear and renewables, uh, of course, will help. But the, as was mentioned, there, there are some uh, hard to abate sectors. So we will need not only electricity, but we will need low carbon heat. We will need low carbon hydrogen, as was mentioned before. And uh, uh, nu nuclear power plants and nuclear boilers have the possibility to displace uh, the use of, uh, uh, of uh, coal-fired power plants and coal boilers used in industry. Uh, quite interestingly is that um, um, a great number of countries that are highly dependent on, on, on coal also have nuclear. So, so for them to, to amplify their uh, use of nuclear is not such a big uh, um, uh, um, a challenge. And so, so we, we could see a faster uh, deployment of nuclear in those countries that already have uh, nuclear and coal. Next slide, please. <laughs> So this is maybe the, the central uh, chapter for this discussion on, 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 on nuclear and renewables and, and, and hydrogen. So I won't repeat uh, the, the same messages that Diane and uh, other speakers have, have mentioned, um, but I would like to, to um, illustrate also or, or give you an example of a study we, we performed or we, we helped support. It's a study led by Urenco that involved um, uh, EDF and Lucid Catalyst and, and ourselves at the IAEA and was performed by a company called Aurora. It was about decarbonizing hydrogen in the net zero economy. And um, the, the, the findings that were, were, that were uh, uh, mentioned uh, just, just before, uh, you know, we can find indeed in, in this modeling that uh, uh, nuclear can help uh, produce a significant amount of that low carbon hydrogen that's needed. And if for some reason blue hydrogen, hydrogen from, from, from uh, 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 steam methane reforming and CCS is not available or is not deployed at the scale that, uh, that is expected, then actually uh, hydrogen produced by nuclear, including by high temperature steam electrolysis or thermal processes, can, can uh, get a large share of that uh, uh, market for new, new clean hydrogen. Next slide, please. Uh, um, Valérie had asked me also to illustrate the, the importance of, 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 of uh, how nuclear and, and uh, can provide the flexibility that uh, energy systems with large shares of renewables require. So uh, as, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, um, nuclear is a flexible technology. Uh, the, the experience of the French fleet on, on, on ramping rates, load following is, is there as well. But I would also like to uh, point out to analysis that was performed by by, by the agency on um, analyzing uh, uh, the energy systems during the, the, the first lockdown period uh, last year, where basically with the uh, decrease in the energy demand, um, the, the energy systems were dominated by, by low carbon systems, including renewables. So you actually had in some markets electricity systems with very large shares of renewables that had not been expected at this time. They're expected in, in, 20, in the late 2020s, around 2030. But uh, 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 systems uh, uh, such as uh, uh, were experienced last, last year, uh, nu nuclear performed very well in, in supporting uh, the, the variable generation and uh, uh, by providing the, the required flexibility. I would say in the future, hydrogen will provide, will help uh, enhance the flexibility of those energy systems. So, so having hydrogen in addition to, to nuclear and, and, and renewables will help having more uh, uh, reliable and flexible uh, low carbon power systems. Next slide, please. 
Climate resilience. This is a, 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 an important an important topic, um, one that's been discussed uh, uh, today. There there are several speakers and uh, uh, in, in other sessions today. But uh, we've experienced uh, in recent years, and this year in particular, uh, uh, several s ex uh, extreme weather events that have uh, uh, challenged um, and, and threatened our energy systems. And uh, uh, the, the, the analysis we've made at, at, at the IAEA, but also uh, recently published uh, results uh, from the OECD nuclear energy, and I also want to point out to a study that was performed in Sweden by Energi Fosk on the uh, resilience of the um, uh, nuclear power system in, in, in Scandinavian countries in Finland and, and Sweden, that uh, having nuclear in, in, in the grid helps uh, improve the, the reliability against extreme, extreme weather events. Um, having a reliable energy system does not, not, not only requires reliable generation, it also requires a, a whole uh, um, uh, system approach and an and improvement of the resilience of the grid and, and the generation and, and, and the demand as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know we're we're coming out of uh, of the pandemic. It was still still on, but uh, there's an urgency for governments to not only help uh, um, with the economic recovery, but also align those investments with the objectives of a clean energy transitions. So one message that uh, uh, we we deliver in in our publication is that actually investing in in, in um, uh, investing in, in nuclear power makes a lot of sense. Uh, Fatih Birol earlier on mentioned uh, uh, investing in long-term operation as, uh, as the, the solution for the, one of the lowest uh, uh, cost, um, uh, low carbon electricity, but also uh, investing in new build creates a lot of jobs. And uh, I would like to refer to a study by the International Monetary Fund that was published in, in uh, March this year, which uh, compared uh, green multipliers uh, uh, related to investments in clean energy technologies, nuclear, renewables, but also investments in fossil fuels. And, and the good news was that investing in clean technologies uh, far outweighs investment in, in, in fossil, fossil technologies, which is, which is good. Uh, but the, 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 the point on nuclear is that actually uh, investment on, on, on nuclear has the highest uh, uh, green multipliers uh, because of the, the, I would say, the, the intensity of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the construction and the job creation it, 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 uh, it, it um, uh, brings. Uh, last slide, please, and I will conclude. Um, nuclear has a unique attributes to play in the transition to net zero. Um, as far as I know, it's one of the only technologies, if, if not the only one, that can provide at scale uh, low carbon electricity, low carbon heat, and low carbon hydrogen. And in that sense, it can complement renewables by providing dispatchability, flexibility, and security of supply. Uh, and, and, and as was mentioned, support low carbon hydrogen production uh, on the massive scale what, that we will uh, require. We need innovation, we need to accelerate innovation, we need governments to, to provide um, uh, incentives for the demonstration of those advanced reactors which, which are needed. Um, you may remember that uh, the IEA and Fatih Birol had, had half of the cut in emissions that we need to get to net zero will come from technologies that are not yet on the market. Uh, and, and for nuclear, this, this means the, the, the small modular reactors and the advanced reactors that need to be commercialized in, in the 2030s to really have a, an impact on, on, on the transition to, to net zero. Of course, to make it happen, there needs to be the, the right policies, the right uh, financing framework, so a level playing field for all low carbon technologies. And I'll just conclude by inviting you to join uh, an IAEA event uh, entitled Nuclear Innovation for a Net Zero World, which takes place today at four o'clock on a, on a pavilion uh, PV67, about 50 meters from here. Thank you very much. I want to thank our speakers very much. It was really a very interesting and uh, fruitful session. And unf unfortunately, we are a bit late, so we will not have uh, time for questions, but uh, we're going to break to um, release the room. And please feel free to, to come and ask questions to our speakers. First, we need a, a family photo. <laughs>
Ike. Doesn't work at all? Okay. It's okay if I speak, yeah? It's okay? So, yes? She says it's okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can listen to us. If you have your earphones, normally you should listen. Are you okay? Yes? It's okay? Thank you. Uh, my name is Gérard Wolf. I am uh, the chairman of uh, Task Force uh, Sustainable Cities in MEDEF International. MEDEF, as you, some of you may know, is the French private sector. And um, it's a uh, privilege to be here. Uh, I understand that we are one of the private sector um, delegation, but not so much in the COP26 as uh, private sector, organized private sectors. So uh, we are very happy to be here and to talk about French expertise on sustainable uh, cities. Uh, just a word about uh, MEDEF International, for those of you who are not French. Uh, it's a, um, it's, it, it gathers 70% of the private sector's companies in France. And we have um, together uh, uh, um, in, in, the, in the task force, more than 400 companies in uh, the sustainable cities area, let's say, or sector. Um, today, we will uh, try to give a little bit of uh, flavor and certainly examples with my colleagues on what's exactly our expertise on sustainable cities. Just before, I want to remind everybody that we are facing an enormous wave of new urban inhabitants, 2.5 billion people in the world coming in the next 30 years, 40% of them in Africa, 20% of them in China, uh, sorry, in India, 10% uh, of them in China and the rest in the rest of the world. And uh, the way we approach this is having a holistic approach to be sure that we can uh, find the right solutions uh, for these ur new urbans and, of course, to extend the existing uh, solutions for the urban population. We will begin with um, uh, short preliminary uh, remarks, uh, collective actions of the private sector uh, done by um, Gilles vermeaux -des Roches, who is uh, the big boss of the French business uh, climate change pledge and uh, climate pledge, sorry, gathering uh, around th 300 French companies on uh, climate pledge and he will explain in five minutes what's going on about this pledge. Gilles? Ah oui, mais moi, il faut plus écouter. Thank you very much, Chair, for this introduction. The fact is the, uh, our pledge, our ambition, when it comes to the cities, is to understand that companies have to build the agenda of solutions. Uh, there is a certain amount of solutions, of technologies, that are already in place in order to build tomorrow's city. It is about uh, distributing energy uh, in another way, to create it directly, to, uh, to make, uh, to, to smooth up transport. And tomorrow's cities, as Gérard was saying, might in many places around the world be more and more numerous cities. There, there will be more cities and cities are going to get bigger. So we have to build upon dynamics that build net zero. Net zero, which we might find another expression, which is the, the true zero. Since it is important now, uh, nowadays, when it comes to the city that we are building now, we'll talk about the other ones later, but we have to be in the capacity to build infrastructures and to 
give them, uh, to make them available for, the, for people with this will to make it zero carbon. We have this advantage in France, thanks to our big companies and thanks to our SMEs to be pretty much focused upon the, uh, the city energy, water in the cities, and way to pilot cities topics and by way piloting elect the electrification of all usage through uh, digitalization. So the big question for tomorrow morning when it comes to all these networks that are linked with the circular economy, which is not only about having products, repairing them and reusing them and recycling them, it's also about mm, creating a sharing economy, hence the need for traceability and the capacity, it's also the capacity probably within cities to empower uh, the inhabitants. In the past, big players would bring on the table most of the needs in terms of transport, in terms of energy, and then we'd ask citizens to use them. Now, in the future, we are all about to become producers, uh, agriculture producers, many cities work on that, uh, transport producers thanks to car sharing uh, thanks to being committed to uh, to travel in a more flexible way and it comes to when it comes to energy as well so nowadays we have these capacities we have these leverages in france as i was saying not only thanks to big companies but also to th thanks to smes we have the solutions for tomorrow but we still need the solutions for 2050 to be speaking now allowed to be allowed to speak about into in 2050, it's like it's like speaking about now in 1990. Think about the world back in 1990. People didn't know about the solutions we we, we have now, so we probably don't know the solutions that we have that will be available in 2050. But that's the opportunity now to say for each company, okay, this is my long run, long term vision in terms of decarbonation but I also have short-term commitments. And for those, innovation is key. No uh, new solutions will come over tomorrow should the companies not put their innovation capacities, their capacities to involve young people, because young people think differently about the present and about the future, to, uh, mob to mobilize them for the future of sustainable cities. This is why we created these dynamics. And this is why there are representatives of this dynamic here at the COP26. This is about uh, energy efficiency, uh, about efficiency, broadly speaking, and about innovation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jill. What we want to do now is to uh, explain a sector by sector give uh, several uh, examples of what we are able to do, and then if there are, there, are, there are questions, we'll be able to answer. So we'll start the, the building and the infrastructures. So first, you see those, who's the uh, CEO of Vika, the biggest cement producer in France. So he tells us his vision on this, on the subject, but he's also the co-president of the, the commission uh, of the ecological transition of the MEDEF. Guy, your turn. Thank you, Gérard. Uh, when it comes to uh, ecological um, decarbonation and uh, the transition, the government uh, defines the objectives and the framework and the companies that are involved. The MEDEF represents more than 200,000 companies these are the companies that come with solutions. I can give you an example of, uh, of the sector of the cement. And uh, we know that we don't have a very good, historically not a good uh, reputation. I will give you three figures. Uh, the carbon uh, footprint, world footprint, it's 8% of the emissions. In Europe, it's 4%. In France, we are at 1.8% percent of the carbon footprint, which shows the efforts that have been implemented for years before it uh, became to be uh, being urgent. We wanted to, uh, to lower the, uh, the footprint of the materials for, for construction. When Gérard tells us that 2 point billions we expect uh, be before 200, 2050, it means 6.6 .6, uh, 
billion of urbans in, uh, on Earth. So this scale of time and of the number of, of residents, we have no alternative to, to cement when it comes to construction materials available in, uh, in, in good cost and good quantity uh, close to uh, the construction sites. So we have no other choice uh, rather than to decarbonate. We are able to, uh, to make um, concrete, uh, of course there's, there's cement in it, and the cost for uh, the emissions is that we are able to produce uh, decarbonated concrete that is less coordinated than wood. Uh, here, every stand uh, will uh, will go to the garbage. We will uh, replace the fossil energies because they will be burned. Uh, this is an example, a uh, precise example, that shows that the companies, uh, through innovation, uh, do their carbonate. I could speak hours about it when we talk hydrogen. Uh, among the most active in terms of production, the uh, projects of production of hydrogen, we have the, the cement pro producers who will use hydrogen to combine hydrogen with uh, with the carbon and to create to, to produce uh, methanol that will allow to decarbonate the uh, maritime or uh, air transport. This is the engagement of French companies for the decarbonation. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if. Carole or Michel uh, want to speak first. Carole? I will follow Guy, who's uh, my friend, because we are both the presidents of the Commission of uh, the uh, Transition Com Commission in MEDEF. Me too, I am, uh, I'm a CEO of, uh, of Sustainable Development, Development in Total Energy. So I'll follow what uh, he said. I have three messages for you. The, fir the first one is that when you, f when you produce in France, you participate into the decarbonization of the world because we have an energy mix it is more decarbonated than many countries. And of course, because we'll be able to consume locally these projects in, in France. So it's a subject on which we've been working a lot with all the, uh, the uh, MEDEF ecosystem is to uh, to help to the reindustrialization in our country. So these all the new products and the products that we need every day are here. Second message is uh, the, the subjects of uh, ecological transition, energetical, tr this, this, these, are, these are challenges, systemic challenges. It will require innovation uh, that are on the limits of uh, our uh, of our mutual um, specializations that will, uh, that will require a cooperation between the public and the private actors. So these uh, chains are changing. So we want to transform the mobility that is going to become a very important subject in tomorrow's cities because we work with uh, Daimler-Benz and Stellantis to build a big factory in Europe, in France, uh, to produce battery batteries to accelerate this, uh, this transition to, um, to electric mobility. We also transform our uh, gas stations, our charge stations, to participate to the mobility of all the actors. And maybe the, the last message I wanted to share with you is that it's import, important for our companies, whatever they are, uh, to reconnect with nature. In our um, urban uh, modes of life, it became more uh, difficult when you were growing up in the countryside. But this nature that you can't be seen you know, is uh, like a deco. It's a, it's a function, vital function of, no, of no happy that our habitat as human. The nature will be, will be part of the solutions to, in order to allow uh, sustainable habitat. Of course, we need greenery in, uh, in towns so, uh, they, so they don't get too hot during hot periods. In all our businesses, we are concerned by a better attention to the biodiversity and that the impact that we can have on the nature, something that uh, we've experienced for a long time uh, as uh, we need to, uh, to prevent a uh, uh, bad a negative impact. Now we want to have a positive impact with the, and we want the companies to, 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 to participate in the regeneration of natural spaces because this is the environment we all need. 
I don't know whether there are still headsets available for people because I see there are people who would like to take part in the events and uh, don't have a any uh, any headsets. So it depends upon the amount uh, of headsets we have. You you'll need yours, I think. So that, that's kind from you. But uh, Michel, uh, you will have the floor in a couple of minutes. Without further ado, and Carol, uh, if you would be so very kind to leave your chair for the other panelists that are to join us, and which are namely Patricia and and Patricia, Patricia and Patricia. So, Patricia, Michel, the floor is yours. Oui. Gilles, will you stay with us? Yeah, thank you, Gérard. Okay, do you hear me well? Perfectly. All right, that's great. So, thanks you. First things first, thank you, Gérard. I think what's well interested when it comes to sustainable cities is to be talking about a certain amount of topics. The, the big ones, of course, the important ones like transport, like water, like energy, but waste management as well, because uh, this is a, a, a topic that is to become more and more important in, in the upcoming years, uh, given the, the uh, urbanization that is just uh, taking momentum. So, th so there are going to be more cities, and cities are going to get bigger. There is not only one answer to bring to this, uh, to this situation. My, my company's name is Sulo. We are specialized in the uh, production of uh, waste containers for all kinds of rubbish. Uh, we, we are one of the leaders, the world leaders, in this uh, specialization. And we've, got, we've got lots of experience. And I think what is important is to see the deep modification that occurs, that is occurring at this moment within the change, the shift when it comes to segregation there. Because segregation and upcycling are the two key words. You can't upcycle without a good segregation. So it takes education, that is at the core of the topic, educating chi uh, children, educating grown-ups as well. Everybody, it's about uh, being a uh, feeling being a citizen, feeling responsible for, for the state of the planet when you throw your rubbish out. And it's also about valorizing, upcycling uh, waste. Waste until, until, uh, a recent, um, until recently was considered as something we, we should hide. It's, it's, it's over. Now we don't want to hide rubbish, we want to segregate it in order to take out from it the most valuable, the most precious things. We build uh, we built uh, rolling containers, you know this one, these uh, rubbish bins on wheels that, that you see in the cities, and they are made from uh, recycled materials, 100% from plastic that we do buy from recycling companies that get it w in the rubbish bins, in, within the waste. So as you see, it's recycling, recycling. So if, if, you, if you get a proper segregation, you can really work upon a proper upcycling. It's a, it's a bit of a circular economy that has been put in place and it's more and more getting more and more professional and I think that, uh, that during the upcoming years this is a phenomenon too that will get broader and broader and you'll find examples in by and large in the world. So the, the, the material that we get, the amount of material, of raw material that we get isn't uh, sufficient uh, unfortunately, but I would like to stick to the to the topic of our of our today's the, of today's discussion, which is about sustainable cities. And the the, the, the problem is we we struggle with segrega segregating waste in the d in the centre of the cities. So it takes new policies in order to be the capacity to offer citizens the means to evacuate and to segregate properly their own rubbish. We have elaborated together with the City Council of Paris a new system of, uh, it's called Trilib. Uh, it's ec it echoes Velib. Velib is it's bike sharing. Um, every, everything's called Lib. But it's about finding stations and giving the possibility to the citizens to segregate their rubbish on their own. They lack space, of course, para, para people in Paris lack space, and it's not going to get better. And the use of every square meter that, that, we, that we manage is, isn't going to get easier. So we have to find some space to, uh, to stock rubbish, to stock waste, and to be in the capacity to create 
nice places, places uh, because you can segregate your, your waste in a pleasant manner, in a pleasant space. It takes a good design, of course, and there is a huge work that is being performed uh, from that point of view when it comes to design. So it's about integrating design um, when it comes to this uh, um, waste storage management spaces. Thank you very much, Michel. So I think what we're going to do now, there is one thing we, we, we haven't said, uh, at the beginning, which is that the expertise in France uh, has decided during the pandemics, listening while listening, and thanks to the fact that we had been listening to companies on field in France and abroad, why we stayed, why, because very often local directors, local managers uh, stayed in place. And the reason is we had to, uh, the essential services had to be going on. We couldn't stop them, stop, we couldn't stop providing them. So we came up with a logic of French initiative uh, concerning essential services. And there are four of them. It is water, it's waste management, it's about energy, all kinds of energy services, and number four, transport, urban transport, seems simple at first glance, and perhaps it is, but slowly w we organized several webinars together with wor the World Bank, with the Mayor, Mayor's Federation, the FMDV, uh, that I hail from this place. We've worked a lot about the development of cities, and it's very important for us to, be keep, to keep working on this axis. When within a city you get water, energy, transport, and uh, water, and if you keep sorting your waste while well, you're nearly out of the woods. Uh, yesterday, we received not Gilles. Gilles wasn't there because Gilles was already here. But we invited, we gathered together with our director, the uh, presi president the, uh, from Colombia, who was saying that these four pillars are the most important ones. It is a question of honor for me, and a source of honor. Because when I came into function as a president of the Republic of, of uh, Colombia, we, we were uh, sorting about 5% of our waste. Now it's about 15%, and I think that it will be 25% when I, uh, when I switch the light off. Uh, in my office. And it's the same issue in Africa, the same uh, issue in Rwanda, the same topic we might be talking about uh, at the Ivory Coast, and, and we'll, we would we'll land up talking about the same topics, more or less. And I would like to give the floor now to Patricia. For her, she's one of the managers of uh, Keolis. Perhaps you could remind what Keolis is, by the way, and uh, talk about your contribution to this logic. We can't hear you. It's okay now. Perfect. So Kelly is a world reader, not on the transportation, but I'd say mobility. Kelly is a is a partner of three hundred communities uh, throughout the th uh, in the world from sixteen countries on all the continents, and partner of the mobility with the metropolis and the territories uh, associated associated territories. I'm talking about m mobility, not about transport, because our mission is not about uh, to, is not transporting people like packages from A to B, but rather to accompany people in their mobility. And the mobility it's also is also the freedom uh, to be uh, to to, to uh, access uh, jobs. We're talking about people who don't, don't have the possibility to have uh, the good trans personal transportation means. The mobility also is the freedom to, to move uh, from one point to another for leisure needs. It's also the possibility uh, to, to move for, for this when you want to study. So we participate to the prosperity of the metropolis and the t of the territories because, because we, we, uh, we are a junction between uh, cities and everything that is around the cities. Kelly uh, is also a multimodal mobility. So what we propose to, uh, to, to Metropolis 
it's different modes of transport, uh, soft transport uh, like uh, uh, like walking or like cycling. We can. Uh, we are also supposed to accompany uh, people who, uh, who work uh, in cities to choose their mobility, the type of mobility. So uh, apart, uh, you can you can car share, you can take the the bus and so on. All this package. And acquires innovation on everything that is the sharing data and also the, uh, the collection of, of, of data, everything that we may call, uh, everything that we may call smart city, uh, sharing with other networks, not only transport, but an, another like uh, network, uh, telephone network or uh, energy networks, uh, city networks, of course. And also the engagement of uh, Kelly's in the prosperity, but the sustainability of the city. So everything that concerns the ecological t transition, uh, circular economy, the protection of the resources. Our, in our missions, we also have an engagement of uh, circular economy, local economy, circular economy. So we work in partnership with uh, local companies to valorize the, the waste. So this participates also to, to, to the creation of new um, jobs on the territory. We participate also to, cre to, to the creation of uh, jobs uh, in our specializations because our, uh, our job, we are in a, uh, a tr an energetic transition. So we, uh, we, move, we switch from diesels to uh, hydrogen or electric uh, buses. That means new jobs, new uh, specialties. And uh, not only we not only we we um, provide these new uh, buses, but we also train people for to, to these new specializations. We also uh, develop the, the local environment of circular economy, and I would say also I would say social and solid there. That allows us to create new uh, jobs and specialties in it. So it participates to, to help to the prosperity. And it's not only about transporting people from A to B, from points A to B. Uh, an important point I would like to share with you is the fact that, that we have inclusive mobilities, inclusive uh, uh, when it comes to space between the city and its territory, and inclusive uh, when it comes to, to the, the difficulties that you may encounter uh, in cities. And uh, that means accessibility, physical accessibility, but also cultural accessibility, psychological accessibility, because there are, there are things that are fragilities that are not only f physical, but, uh, uh, but temporary or due to the, the age or the fact that you may be a foreigner in a city, uh, like, a, like a tourist, okay? So you know to find your way in the city. The inclusivity is uh, realized by by the digital, uh, but also by the accompanying the people with problems. We have at, the, at this at the disposal of this, we have persons who accompany people with problems who are not who are unable to, who are, don't have uh, access to the digital for different reasons. Uh, accompanying of two, three maximum days, maximum, depending on the needs. This is all we can offer, we can propose mobility, inclusive mobility, and, um, sustainable, that participate to the prosperity of the metropoles and territories. An example, we manage transports uh, of the city of Stockholm with the, tr with the, with the transition, we re reduce by 85% the emissions of CO2 in, the, in, in Stockholm. Uh, just in transport, okay? Uh, we are also engaged in the reduction and the transition to uh, alternative energy for the, the buildings, because also have an industri industrial aspects. We do maintenance of vehicles, so we are very engaged in all the, the global package of the energetic transition in the uh, circular economy and the production of resources, especially water, uh, uh, in terms of quality and quantity, and also the raw materials, because we have a policy of uh, purchase that privilege, gives privilege to responsible uh, buying, ethical buying, but also the, the, we also do want that, to reduce the production of waste, like uh, packaging and the use of the secondary and primary um, 
things that are uh, reusable. So we train people who work with us uh, to reuse and to repair no, instead of throwing out. So we are engaged by the end of the, the life of the, our project, projects so we can uh, uh, know what our providers uh, do it. So we are engaged ethically in all the value change of the circular economy. As we still have a little bit of time, I will ask, that was not uh, planned, but I will uh, ask Safi to join us on stage, uh, because uh, Patricia was talking about digital, and we know how much uh, this digital is important. Sophie is one of the uh, uh, directors of Thales, you know the group, the Thales group. Uh, I will just ask you to, to, to ask you uh, to, to, to say a word about what Thales is doing in terms of digitalization to help to this transition. And then I will ask to, to Gilles to, uh, as uh, you, you've been to all the COPs and you have a real function uh, transversal in all the COPs as a rec recognized French experts, expert, we all know it. So you give us your um, feelings about it and then we'll have uh, Q&As as we still have a little bit of time. Sophie. Sophie, 10 minutes. If you would, uh, you just have to switch, to switch it on. No, it doesn't work for now. What about now? Far better. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this panel. We are committed, indeed, towards um, in the field of um, digitalization. When it comes to transport, with the services digitalization, when it comes to uh, trajectories management for, for land transport, um, underground transport, and air transport as well. Uh, which gives the possibility to optimize the consumption and uh, time management in order to uh, avoid um, uh, over con consumption, for instance, and contribute to the de decarbonation of this, of this sector throughout a better, man man a better management of the trajectories. And it's also about everyday life. There is inclusion and diversity, and the topic uh, of transport has been mentioned. There is also a whole optimi optimizing chapter when it comes to uh, travel experience. It's about finding the best, the best solution, the most cost-effective and the less polluting uh, solution, with being at stake as well a smart city uh, smart cities topics. I don't know the French for that. For, for, for it's smart city as well in French, right? Uh, and we have to integrate uh, a security aspect, a security dimension. Um, travelers have to be safe, and it takes every now and then uh, AI for transport and everything which is uh, about security, making, um, identifying people. Uh, tools securing to be in the capacity to build up these competencies. They often ask for digital solutions and for inclusion is very important in different various sectors to be in the, the capacity to extend the amount of tools we have since in our everyday life we are getting more and more pregnant. Uh, plus, digitalization has to be uh, to, cons to uh, use as less energy as it takes. So you have to be sober in terms of design, in terms of codification. This, uh, is, this is quite technical, sorry about that, but uh, when, it, when you develop algorithms and, and uh, sober when it comes to servers as well. So it's big data versus smart data. It's about small is beautiful, etc., etc. These topics are crucial when it comes to adopting the right solutions in our everyday life. Thank you, Sophie. So you see that it's, uh, it's a block. Things are not apart, they're together. Uh, it's a, a true system that is widely uh, interconnected by and large to a great extent. Gilles, uh, social media always offer 
uh, bring their, their lot of surprises. Sometimes you find pictures that you've, you've, you'd fo you had forgotten about, and suddenly they, they pop up. Uh, in December 2016, I remember it was COP in Paris, the Arc de Triomphe was green, and it was written, COP21, we've done it. And I, I received this picture yesterday, yet another time, after having forgotten about it. It was indeed a crucial step that we had made, but I think w we are not out of the woods yet. And uh, uh, St. August would say back in the days, you have to go down your path, because this path wouldn't exist if you weren't walking by this path. And that's, that's about it. So we, we, we know the, the steps we have to make. There is this 100 billion uh, bit that we uh, agreed upon in order to accompany the development towards um, our goals. And we are far from being out of the woods. We are far from having 100 billion for now. And what we are doing is we are adding, we are adding lended money to given money which is quite different from uh, what we had decided back then. And we won't be committing the whole planet uh, that way, first thing. Second thing, during this COP26, we expect from the countries to, uh, to enhance, to, to make their ambitions bigger. Uh, think about Brazil. This is one of the main obstacles. Uh, and when it's coming to it, this COP26 has been opened during uh, quite peculiar times because we've been talking a lot about climate topics, climate related topics, but I hear voices um, saying that we won't, we will ne never save climate without saving biodiversity. Lots of researchers, and not only researchers, mention that after this. Uh, COP26 and after the uh, biodiversity COP in China, we, w we should understand that we should play on both fields because the uh, climate ambitions and our biodiversity ambitions go together in the same di direction. Being in eastern France, you can't, you can't plant the same trees as you used to 30 years ago. And so, so you see, it's very concrete, and there is a, a third topic that is connected, which is that we cannot save the planet without saving people. And the, the great question, whether what's going to be the situation in 2050 and how we are going to push things forward climate-wise, you know, there is no consensus when it comes to poverty reduction. Uh, this COP26 is probably crucial when it comes to finding these $100 billion to add to help developing countries. Plus two, when it comes to fight for biodiversity and development. And three, uh, when it comes to putting pressure on various countries, when it comes to respecting their roadmaps, because we are far from uh, the ends of the game, really. Um, and when it comes to, to the non-state playmakers, the private sector, as us, or the NGOs, we should be better equipped and better organized and better coordinated and play like a team uh, at, at a world level to go towards innovation. Three minutes left, thank you. Uh, if my, my information is correct, I would like to say that this is what's at stake at a world level. We the private sector, we consider that we are not accountable for the political decisions, of course, but when it comes to the technical solutions, we are in charge. French companies are more than committed. I think that we've heard uh, several good examples. Everything we've been saying now, we've been saying now is recorded, and uh, I guess many people are going to, uh, are listening to this live, and uh, more people even are going to listen to it shortly afterwards. We, do we have some spare time for a couple of quest questions? How many minutes do we have? Three, two, less than two. No questions anyway. So we, we'll be, we, we, we won't be uh, living far away. You can catch us a few meters from there, from, from here. Should you want to ask us a couple of questions, Thank you very much, and thanks to the many thanks to the French Pavilion for welcoming us, and see you very soon.
Thank you.
c'est bon Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon everyone. A warm welcome to the French Papillon on the occasion of an event on cruise. Mr. Minister, Mr. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you, those who are here together with us and those who are listening from elsewhere. Welcome to the French Pavillon, to this event dedicated to early warning systems. Welcome as well to the representative of Germany. Your support has been extremely useful. And welcome to the representative of the program of the Pacific for the environment. Thank you to all of you. De designing solutions to prevent the risk of natural disasters should be a priority. And this is the reason why today we are working in particular on the cruise initiative on climate risk and early warning systems that was launched at COP21. And we held a 14th um, um, steering committee yesterday under the presidency of France. And I would like to commend the results, very positive ones, obtained by crews. And we will have opportunities, of course, to get back to them in the course of this event. To begin with, and without further ado, I'll suggest that we watch a video that will present in a very concrete manner what cruise organizes. sur la météorologie, les prévisions météo, euh, et météo et, et les formations que j'ai reçues m'ont permis vraiment de, de m'améliorer et d'améliorer mes pratiques culturelles. Euh, bon, moi je sais que par exemple avec les prévisions de cette année, j'ai dû s'aimer beaucoup de nébé. J'ai pu récolter à temps. Et, donc euh, ça m'a permis en tout cas d'avoir quand même quelque chose pour euh, gérer euh, la famille. So and in it the such as cruise can be a powerful mechanism to help the least developed countries and the small island states adapt to climate change and the growing number of weather-related disasters. We should try and uh, promote impact-based forecasting because this will ensure that the data generated are used by the target audience. Vision, on sait quand est-ce qu'il va pleuvoir, et donc on n'engage pas, on n'engage plus les dépenses et à tout texte. Voilà, ça dit que tout est vraiment planifié de sorte que on ne gaspille plus de l'argent, on ne perd plus en temps. Et donc vraiment, la différence à ce niveau-là, ce n'est plus discutable. C'est toujours des difficultés. Voilà. Il y en a même qui s'entêtent à continuer d'utiliser les anciennes spéculations à cycle long. Alors que bon, tout le monde sait qu'avec les changements climatiques, là, ce n'est plus évident. Il faut s'adapter. Voilà.
my name is James Kireka. I'm a Wetham Tani leader. Wetham Tani is a group of uh, community leaders who interpret and translate the weather forecast that comes from the Kenya Meteorological Department into a simple language that uh, people in Kibera can easily understand. Bill Ali Ayewa KMD wametangaza mchana kutakuwa na mvua kwa wiki nzima isipokuwa Monday tunawashauri mfungue mitaro mvai jacket na mchunge watoto wasicheze karibu na mtu Hashtag #radaweb People in my community did not care about the weather forecast because uh, one, it was not uh, relevant to the area. It was just talking about the whole of Nairobi. Secondly, the language used was too technical. After we convert the forecast into SMS, we send the SMS to other members of the community that includes our friends, our families, our neighbors, so it gets to spread all over. The waypoint that currently is deployed in Darawa will, uh, will be the, the first ever waypoint. The main objective will be the waypoint system is to try and improve the, uh, the ocean forecast and as well as the coastal inundation forecast. Just imagine in the vast region we are responsible for in terms of providing ocean forecast, monitoring the ocean conditions. Once the, the project has been successfully in Tarawa, Kiribati comprises of 33 islands, so we hope to duplicate the same as service to the other islands. Just want to acknowledge the support from the Government of Canada through the, the CRUISE project, the World Meteorological Organization, their funding support for supporting the coastal inundation project in Kiribati. Initiatives such as CRUISE have the opportunity to transform their existing $70 million worth of technical assistance, which is really, really important, into billions of dollars in the last mile early warning systems. I think that there's a lot more opportunities for collaboration on the, the ongoing work of uh, crews on analysis. We could also use that uh, to build our investment portfolio within the GCF. Excellent work is being done by the Crews and Reap initiatives to make up the severe deficit of early warning systems in low and middle income countries. Both initiatives fully embrace the guiding principles and targets of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. To realize this potential, the World Bank and GFDRR are ready to work with crews, the donors, the implementing uh, partners towards integrating early warning systems as part of the national development priorities so that one can have a bigger impact and much more sustainable change on the ground. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the crew secretariat for preparing this uh, video. And thank you very much for everything you're doing. We enjoy some excellent cooperation between the secretariat and uh, the donor countries, including France in particular. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Monsieur le Ministers, members of the panel, Mr. Chairman, you, the Chairman or the President, dear friends, for many of us, climate disruption have nothing abstract. It's anything but a remote or an abstract threat. To the opposite, it is a very concrete threat very topical as well for our countries and for the countries that are already suffering 
a very direct impact. I have in mind in particular the southern countries and the island states, and we're very well aware that they are extremely exposed. The risk of natural disasters is five times higher than it was 50 years ago due to climate change and to the multiplication of extreme weather phenomena. This has been proven by scientists, and some of you here present have seen it by themselves, unfortunately. This is the reason why, on the occasion of COP21 in Paris, we launched the CRUISE initiative in order to develop some early warning systems in vulnerable countries. And since 2015, this initiative has enabled to make a genuine difference on the ground and uh, to concrete in a, uh, to progress in a very concrete manner within the Sandai framework defined in 20, March 2015 in order to reduce uh, the risk of um, natural disasters. Cruise already committed 50, uh, already in, uh, invested 50 million dollars, a half of which provided by France. Uh, uh, to finance uh, projects in about 50 countries, and we've seen some examples in the video. In, um, during the year 2020 alone, and I would like to insist on this very telling figure, uh, we allowed 114 million people to be better protected in the event of a disaster. And here I would like to thank uh, the states that particularly contribute financially to this initiative. Germany to begin with. Uh, Germany has been stand, standing by our side since the very beginning. Also, expand our thanks to our multilateral partners. Their expertise is extremely valuable. The World Bank, the World Meteorological um, Organization, um, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Nonetheless, we know that a lot remains to be done. Collectively, we need uh, to uh, provide ourselves with the means to better support the countries which are at the forefront when it comes to um, natural disasters. They need to be supported to um, improve their technical and logistical capacities. It is our responsibility, it is a matter of solidarity. So how can we do more together? First of all, we need to continue our efforts in order to rally the support of new uh, financial supporters and collectively to s maintain the direction, uh, to stick to the commitment made in 2015. That is a commitment of $100 million per year to support the transition in southern countries. We need to launch some new regional projects, and we will be doing so in, um, um, very soon in the Indian Ocean. We also need uh, to continue our cooperation with our local partners in a cross-cutting logic that includes local schemes of um, uh, risk management and the strengthening of the capacity of um, um, hydrometeorological agencies in order to put in place some concrete um, early warning systems. This is what we're working on in order to protect um, uh, the peoples. The cruise um, initiatives, I would like to say to conclude, um, is a, a wonderful example of what multilateralism should be about. Uh, it is a multilateralism of solidarity, which is reactive, um, very much um, grasping the challenges of our times. It is essential that we strengthen this um, joint commitment in the prospect in particular of the uh, Global Platform for Risk Reduction, which will be um, held in Bali in 2022, and when uh, we continue to work in 2023 of the Sandai framework. This is, ladies and gentlemen, what I meant to say to you here in Glasgow uh, to illustrate what we're doing in order to protect the most vulnerable people. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you, Minister, for your strong message on multilateralism um, supported by evidence. And I now have the pleasure of leaving the floor to His Excellence uh, Simeon Wagdugu of Burkina Faso. Minister, you have the floor. Excellencies, Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs of France, Minister for the Environment of Togo, Madam Representative of Germany, Madam Representative of the Pacific Forum on Climate Change, 
In the name of Burkina Faso, a country of the Sahel, located at the heart of Western Africa, I would like, first of all, to thank the Paris Agreement, which enabled us to institutionalize this important tool of cruise so that we can tackle the crisis, the disasters that arise out of climate change. But Mr. Minister, in Burkina Faso, we're already struggling with the crisis, and you've been facing the same challenges. The issue is that we've been dealing with uh, some strange weather events, both at the same time, drought and um, flood, flooding. And this is impacting the natural resources. And the Sub-Saharan Africa is struggling with all of that. So we also have some community conflicts which are due to the needs to acquire some new land, which, as a matter of fact, is degraded as well. So we need to find solutions to these crises. But we also need a solution to what we're already going through in the context of this climate disruption. This is the reason why we would like to thank you for taking this initiative. And we have many instances. I was just talking about it uh, with Germany, the food crisis. This is due to the fact that we're losing some production, some crop production. There is less and less water, and some other resources are less available. So thank you for shedding light on all of that, because it enables us to see how to improve our production system, and in particular, our warning system. You've seen them here, these um, old person bearing witness to the way they are now listening to the weather forecast in order to better uh, manage their crops. Uh, now they, they are able to, to know whether it's going to be a two or three month season. And farmers now in Burkina Faso are able to know all of that thanks to this project and they know which seed to choose and when to plant. So we have these partners, France and Germany and the Netherlands, and not to forget all of those who will be working on the implementation of this project. And they are using a number of tools or institutions, including a, um, our, a weather agency in Burkina Faso. We have a structure, um, and all together, we now are able to provide all this uh, weather forecast. And we in Burkina Faso are very much implementing this uh, project with um, substantial financial support. Burkina Faso benefited from it. And now we need to expand so that other countries can benefit from all of that. It is a matter of resilience against this climate disruption. So to conclude, I would like to say, Excellency, that we know you, we know you for all of that. Even in France, in Europe, you've been suffering from uh, floods this year. It is not just about words, we need action. It is not for tomorrow, it is now. And like President Kebor was saying, against climate change, for our planet, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. There's one single plan. We need to work and act and do it now in order to protect our land and to make sure that our land can provide us with the necessary, what is necessary to live, to cure our peoples, and to continue. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I now have the pleasure to leave the floor to His Excellency Mr. Katari Fulibazi, Minister of the Environment and Forestry of Togo. Minister, you have the floor. 
Mr. Minister of Foreign Affairs, dear colleagues of Burkina Faso, we call you our neighbors, our northern neighbor. Madam Representative of Germany, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to be attending this major event because as a matter of fact, I believe that now everyone is well aware of the issues regarding climate, climate change. We thought that after COP21 in Paris, many things would change, but as we could see, a lot remains to be done. And one of the consequences of climate change is precisely this crisis that we are constantly going through. In Togo, for example, there used to be four seasons in the south and two in the north of Togo. But due to climate change today, we can no longer talk about four seasons in the south. And even that, it is very difficult for farmers to know when exactly the rain season will start and when the dry season will start. So as a matter of fact, we are very much in a situation where we're waiting. And luckily, there are some weather warning systems, forecast systems, which at the moment are the systems with which we can move forward, not only in order to set the conditions for our farmers to live, because some 70% of our people depend on farming practices, but also to save lives in case of flooding, at the moment, it's in such instances, it's not just the crops which are at risk, but lives are threatened. And very often, some people lose their life in case of flooding. And we have to put in place a warning system. And this warning system uses and relies on anything available, including digital, digital technology. Because when you cannot prevent the flood, you still need to find solutions so that the people can um, do what it takes when this uh, such an event happens. So we need to consider at the moment not only how we will be handling uh, future flooding, but also to very much insist on what should be done to mitigate climate change. We are um, men and women who are, I believe, able to do everything. And our president um, attended the opening of the summit and attended uh, the COP26 for about three days. And his presence was essential and um, very much bear witness, bears witness to his commitment for climate. Uh, and over these three days. He had an opportunity to talk about everything that should be done and to send across as to what should be done, but also to send across a message according to which this fight against climate change cannot be handled in isolation. We need to meet the challenge and to do that we need to do it hand in hand. When there is uh, there's some floods in the uh, Ivory Coast, that the same goes for Togo and probably all along the coast. And then coastal erosion is also an issue for, for us, the coastal states. We can very much see it. We have, for example, two roads from Ghana to Benin and Nigeria, which are already flooded by seawaters. And we have this Waka project in order to 
take, um, do what it takes to make sure that another road does not fall into the sea as well. So we're mobilizing ourselves together, not only to tackle climate change, but also to, to mobilize to weather the different crises. And like my colleague was saying, there is a paradox. At some point in time, you have flooding, but immediately after comes a drought. So these situations are opposite, and we cannot explain that. And it's not drought in the Sahel, but also in some places in um, coastal states. And we can say that this year, most of the countries of Western Africa suffered some very poor crops that led to an increase of um, of uh, food, basic food products. And we had to coordinate within ECOWAS in order to sort out a number of issues. So we therefore commend this initiative because it is also raising awareness and it enables us to understand that the climate issue is something we should work upon collectively. And I would like to thank France for taking this initiative at the time of COP21 and for continuing to say as well that fighting against uh, flooding means also some additional resources, and we commend the significant contribution, financial contribution by France, and we call upon all countries to mobilize on this issue. So once again, thank you very much for this excellent initiative taken uh, very much as we celebrate climate, the climate, and that was launched initially at another COP, a meeting attended by all ministers where all countries are represented. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci à vous, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you, Minister. And it is now my great pleasure to leave the floor uh, to first Mrs. Tangaloa Kumbalao, head of the program, uh, the Pacific Program for the Environment. Ina Stege, who's a, a negotiator for the Marshall Islands and who is also very impacted by all these issues. Thank you. Please. Uh, firstly, Talo Falamba, Honorable Ministers, the Honorable Minister from France, Burkina Faso, and also from Togo, and to my fellow director colleague from Germany. I bring greetings, warm greetings from the Pacific, and I am accompanied here today by uh, the distinguished representative from the Marshall Islands, as well as the special envoy from Niue. And, and so there, as you know, there are not many of us here, but we have come here to amplify our voice. In this particular occasion, distinguished ministers, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to provide remarks on behalf of the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program. For those of you who are not aware, we have the membership of 21, 21 Pacific Island countries and territories. Um, and we also have the coordinating mandate for climate change. We host the Pacific Metrological and Hydrological Council, which is uh, organized into a quite a formidable um, mobilization of the directors from the Pacific. I acknowledge those here who have lost loved ones to the COVID pandemic and commend you uh, for the rising to the importance of this COP. As you know, we've come from Ocean Way and, and, and from it's taken me two days to get here. But this is testament of how important the Pacific region views this conference 
and how important the Pacific, the expectations that we come here uh, and expect to take home. So ladies and gentlemen, our leaders in the Pacific have for 10 years, 10 years, they have stated that climate change is the single greatest threat to our people and to our survival. And this year, we also heard that the IPCC AR6, we know now, links to human-induced um, activity, uh, the perils of climate change. We feel the impacts of climate change now. We feel the changes, we experience the changes in our food security, water security, also our livelihoods of our people. And we know that without real ambition here today, this will get worse and it will make the vulnerable in the Pacific even more vulnerable. I would like to commend the work of the cruise um, project and we acknowledge that early warning systems underpin community resilience. Um, and the Pacific is like a big village. We all know each other and we are connected to each other even though we are three sub-regions of Melanesia, Polynesia and Micronesia. We share the same ocean and we are custodians of that ocean. We are practitioners of traditional knowledge and so we cannot have an early warning system that does not integrate traditional knowledge because that is who we are. We found that 70% of the most resilient people in the Pacific are people who practice traditional knowledge. They are people who read the signs in the sky, the birds, the trees, the grass, and the flowers. And traditionally, those signs tell us when to plant, but like the Honourable Minister said, when to plant the resilient crops, when to plant specific seeds. But now our elders tell us, our trees do not tell us, are not talking to us anymore. Our trees are not telling us what we need to know. And that is because of the climate change, the impacts of climate change. And so the trees, the birds, we are not getting the same signs. And this is why an early warning system such as CRUISE has been very welcome. And I acknowledge the donors, I acknowledge the WMO for your innovation and your boldness to put funding into a program that meets the needs of traditional people and is not designed to depend on technology that is not sustainable. And I just want to give you some examples uh, of this work in Palau. Traditional, the cruise project has funded a traditional weather and climate glossary. It, shows, it, it has converted the indicators that are traditional indicators, put that into a glossary. So now our, the, our people in Palau know there is a scientific uh, explanation for their indicators. What they have used the cruise project to do is to develop a flag warning system for, small, uh, for mariners and for boat operators. In Niue, a small, one of the smallest countries in the South Pacific, Niue has developed a glossary of traditional knowledge indicators. It used this cruise project funds the, the intervention of girls brigade and boys brigade and churches. In the Pacific, the church is integral to society. In the Marshall Islands, Cruise has funded the installation of community warning bells and the development of community response plans. And the bells is very interesting because in the Pacific, sometimes when you have a national event, a tropical cyclone or a natural event, technology will fail because the power grid goes out. 
so you don't have that backup. So in the Marshall Islands, they decided that they will use the traditional barrel system, and that tells them what to do. In Samoa, the cruise project has built the resilience of all coastal villages in Upolu, and it has helped them to develop management plans. Our organization coordinates the work in the Pacific for building resilience. And I'm pleased to, to advise that for the first time we will be translating our courses through our organization into French for our French territories of Wallis Fortuna and French Polynesia. Um, but this is not, we will need further uh, support for this and I look forward to any support that may be forthcoming from our partners here to uh, help them. I heard the ministers, honorable ministers, talk about collective responsibility. You talked about uh, the issues and the actions are not for tomorrow, they're for today. And those are messages that we come from the Pacific to reinform and we agree with you. I would like to take this opportunity, honorable ministers, to acknowledge the partnership of the government of France, the cruise members, Australia, Finland, Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. We acknowledge the kind uh, support and the partnership that we have with the WMO. Thank you, sir. And I would like to also wish you all very fruitful uh, negotiations and may we go home with all of our expectations met. May God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tangaloa, and congratulations to the Pacific Islands for being such drivers of ambition. And we are proud members of the High Ambition Coalition, which has been driven by uh, the Marshall Islands in particular since uh, COP21. And it's now my pleasure to conclude to pass the floor to my dear colleague, Heike, Heike Hen who's uh, a, a representative for Germany at the Ministry of Cooperation. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Ministers Tagaloa. I'm really impressed by the rich knowledge and clear political signals that came out from the different distinguished speakers on the climate crisis we are in and what does it mean in concrete terms for the regions and countries represented here, as well as what does early warning mean uh, in a country or a region like the Pacific and how can it be combined with traditional knowledge. So I don't have to talk now longer about the risks, that is good, um, because we all know, although we talk about the bold and ambitious action we have to take on mitigation and we hope that we not only talk but really act not only when we go home from Glasgow, but when we turn off this stage, that we really act, but we know if we even do it, that the extreme weather events, that the slow onset events, they are already there. And so it's not the one or the other, it's both. And it's with more speed, with more effectiveness, and also with more courage and finance, from the development partner side. And it's not something that we maybe like to hear, but uh, I think the Honorable Minister mentioned the 100 billion promise, and I think this is something we have to work on. So you laid out what we need to do, and the question is a bit how, and how crews plays into what we need to achieve to strengthen the resilience of countries, because this was evident from your elaborate speeches. We cannot achieve the Paris Agreement. We cannot achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, food and nutrition security, for example, and peace and security, 
if we don't get it right together. And uh, we really have to work on this together. And uh, I think what has improved over the last couple of years is really that the extreme events are more predictable. We have more stronger progress on risk analysis. Many institutions and countries involve it in their planning and investments. And this can really help countries to strengthen their resilience, also their fiscal resilience, because this is important to make investments in development. Vulnerable nations like the SITs, the LDCs, can greatly benefit from improved prediction and early warning like Cruz provides. And I think if you in country incorporate these mechanisms in your national risk management strategy, then this can really become a comprehensive package to move forward. So, thanks to the improved early warning systems, disaster risk management, the number of deaths could be uh, really impressively reduced by the factor of three, while the lives still lost by these events are severe and also the socioeconomic effects of these events are grave. And really, we lose development gains that we invested in the countries and partners for decades when we not prepare and strengthen resilience for disasters. And I mean, the good message is that the cost-benefit ratio, if we invest in adaptation, in prevention, in early warning, is 2 to 1 or 10 to 1. So I don't know why we all in private sector not invest more. So it's a real business case where we need to see more engagement. So we are congratulating France for this initiative. We are happy to be a partner of CRUZ and we continue to partner with you in CRUZ. Uh, we committed this year an additional 5 million euros for CRUZ and uh, will engage further with you um, I think early warning is an important step in the global climate and disaster risk architecture that we need. I think it's a place for prevention, for early warning, for insurance, where we as Germany also engage a lot with the Insure Resilience uh, Global Partnership. We need shock resilient loans. We need uh, also to take in the humanitarian actors, we need to talk about losses and damage, we need really a whole range of uh, activities and programs to come up with a comprehensive architecture that really uh, answers the needs of vulnerable countries, LDCs and SITs. Before, because the crises are going to come, they are going to hit hard and we need a better answer from all of us. So thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Heike. And let me also stress how wonderful the relationship is between France and Germany in Cruise. You've been a very, very strong supporter of Cruise since the beginning, and we're very, very grateful for that. I'm afraid we have no more time for questions, so this will conclude the session. I would like to thank all our uh, ministers for having participated. Thank you very much, thank Aloha as well for participating, and Heike.
Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, President of the French Bretagne region, I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about uh, hydrogen and territories. By way of an introduction, I would like to share our vision for that uh, topic that is very dear to my heart. Uh, low carbon activities is at the heart of NG's strategy, and in May of this year, we announced our target of zero carbon by 2045. Local territories are both partners and customers for NG, and therefore they are at the heart of our concerns. The context is a positive one, especially with the adoptions of the Fit for 55 strategy of the European Commission, bringing together industry and mobility. Hydrogen should play a key role in the future in order to achieve our zero carbon targets. By this, I'm talking about uh, vehicles that need large um, autonomy. And how are we going to achieve this? We need to make sure that uh, supply meets demand, making sure that projects are more and more effective. We need to be supported by local governments and national governments. NG wants to create 100 charging stations by 2030. And we have seen this being implemented, well, by this I mean the uh, public private partnership, and we have seen this implemented in the Bretagne project. First, the IGO project in Brittany that will produce 260 uh, hundred kilos of uh, renewable hydrogen for Michelin, on the one hand, as well as to ensure a better mobility for the local government around Van. The second project is called Vigo. It's a more ambitious project that brings together 20 partners, including LIFE, the Bretagne, Normandy, Pays de Loire region, local government, and it will help produce six tons of renewable hydrogen per day, which will help, hopefully, make green mobility more acceptable uh, among the wider public. This is our short-term objective. As for the medium term, we believe that uh, this networking needs to be extended to Europe and making sure that uh, infrastructures are both efficient, both for storage and distribution and supply. We need to make sure that uh, this project is uh, stepped up. We believe that France is very well positioned to win the hydrogen battle first because our geographical situation, location, is ideal. We are at the crossroads of Europe, European roads. We expect uh, 50 terawatt per hour from, transported from Spain to the north of Europe. Second, we have very strong, very well positioned players based in France. Third reason, our local territories have already made commitments, both in Brittany and elsewhere, to support ecosystems. And finally, local governments, including ADEM, which strongly supports such projects, have been stepping up. Now, I would like to leave the floor to both Minister and the President of the Bretagne region to tell us about their perspective. Thank you, Mr. Deputy CEO, President of the Bretagne region, dear Loïc, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone will agree that uh, the energy transition is a paramount priority that requires a mobilization is both from the ecological, the economic and geopolitical fronts because it's a matter of both French and European uh, sovereignty. That is the reason the battle of hydrogen is a key battle to be won. Why? First, because we need to make sure that we move from hydrogen from fossil sources without any carbon capture to a green hydrogen. I know this is possible. I know that there is a strong realization around this. But I also know that uh, this industry is something where our country have a clear advantage from a corporation viewpoint. Our government has decided to make this a priority. 
for France. Seven billion euros have been or will be earmarked, including the investment for the future plan that was announced by the President a short while ago. We need to make sure that our country is a world leader when it comes to hydrogen. And in order to do this, we need to achieve three things. Number one, we need to make sure that uh, a electrolyzes industry is created. The target is to achieve 6.5 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030. Number two, making sure that heavy mobility based on low carbon hydrogen is set up, both for trains and buses. And finally, we need to support the research for future uses of hydrogen, both for the airline industry or storage, as you mentioned. I'm very happy to report that the French industrial sector is rising up to the challenge. It has a know-how throughout the whole value chain when it comes to a low carbon hydrogen. That, and this uh, high value industrial sector will help us make progress on the ecological transition. And it will also help us support our friends and partners both in, uh, around the world, but also in Latin America. NG among other companies, as well as the French research institute, CIA Liten, have developed several projects of green hydrogen in collaboration with Chilean partners. And I'm sure that other projects uh, should be implemented and, and developed in the near future. Mr. Deputy CEO, rest assured that the French government sees this as a key target and an objective and the priority. I would also like to mention the fact that the future of low carbon hydrogen is a major opportunity for economic development, including job creation for local governments and local territories. And I'm sure that uh, Louis Chenet will talk to us about this based on the very important example of Brittany, Bretagne. I'm very happy that uh, this COP in Glasgow is an opportunity for us to meet with the same shared determination. Thank you. Monsieur le ministre, cher Jean-Yves, Monsieur. Minister, dear Jean-Yves, Mr. Deputy CEO, very happy to be here today for this uh, meeting under the auspices of COP26. It's very important for me, Bretagne, Brittany, wants to have its chair in this uh, environmental transition that is key for the future of humanity. We have key actions that have been implemented 10 years ago at the time. I was part of Jean-Yves Le Drian's team, and he was uh, bold enough to launch the uh, offshore wind industry at a time when this seemed like a very innovative project and uh, that was not developed in many different countries around the world. Ten years have passed and we are only starting to plant offshore wind turbines and when we see what's happening here in Scotland we really feel that uh, we need to step up the momentum. We're dealing with a fully fledged revolution here. And why, why am I mentioning wind farms? Well, we know that in the next couple of years, maybe with the AO5, uh, with the uh, number five uh, tender that is being implemented, we might be able, able to create hydrolyzers and, uh, and bring hydrogen back to um, onshore. I've seen that uh, live. Here there is a company that is attending this uh, meeting, and uh, it's a very promising startup. So what we do in Brittany is that we use wind farms as a stepping stone for the future. It's an ongoing project, and the first wind uh, turbines will be set up by next year in the spring, and the first wind farm which has been very controversial, but uh, is the result of 10 years of work. And now we need to pursue what we've been trying to do 
with hydrogen. We need to make sure that our future actions are in line with what we've been doing in the past and are in line with the 2030 plan, also in line with the European Union's ambitions are, making sure that the French local territories are fully on board. In order to do this, we need a grid. We need to make sure that we can bring hydrogen, we can bring energy to the final customers, for lack of which there's really no point in carrying out such uh, projects. We're going to bring energy, we're going to bring electricity to Lorient and to different cities in Bretagne, and we're also supporting new projects. We also need to share to take our share in when it comes to innovation. We need to prepare for the future. And finally, we need to help large-scale projects, including the one that you mentioned, President, in the van, that has been supported both by um, NG and other companies, such as Michelin. We, this, these went to show how possible it is for us to support projects that are large-scale, ambitious, and promising. In the future, new projects will be created and developed, and we believe that we can start working on a zero-carbon base. We have 3,000 buses that run all around the Bretagne territory, both trains, buses, uh, and commercial buses, and we need to make sure that the local government makes sure that we move to zero carbon. If it's produced in Brittany, we can fuel our vehicles with gas or hydrogen, or zero carbon hydrogen, obviously, which is very much in line with what we want to do, which is prepare for a low carbon world and that will also create new growth levers for all of our population, especially for those who suffer from uh, the recurring crisis as I speak. We need to see this as a formidable opportunity and as a way to enter into a new world that will offer new opportunities for our companies and for our youth. This is what I wanted to say. Congratulations for what you do. We're very happy to work with NG as well as LEAF in Nantes, not regardless of what the border, where the border of Bretagne lies. We will work with Europe. This is how we will make progress. Thank you very much. And thank you, Minister. I was very happy to talk to you again on this uh, occasion. Thank you. Merci pour thank you very much for giving us some background about uh, what's going to happen with hydrogen around France. I'm now going to ask Mathieu Guenet, CEO of LIFE, as well as Catherine Brun, who is the General Secretary of GRT Gaz, to join me here for the second part of this session. Uh, no. Est-ce que ça marche Tu m'entends Je te.
C'est bon, je peux y aller Two minutes. Ask to wait for two minutes, so I'm going to sing something in the meantime. All right? No, that was a joke, huh? Il n'y a pas le son Ok All right. So I'm going to go for English. That's going to be better for the, the video that we, that we have. And since we were here all for, from, from all countries, that's, that's going to be better. So if you have the presentation, and okay, the presentation will arrive. And I will make a subtle gesture to pass the, the slides like this one, for example. OK. Yes, OK, like this one. <laughs> OK. So uh, hi, I'm uh, Matt. I'm the CEO of Life and founder of Life, a company that produces hydrogen. But why are we working today? Well, to make slides work uh, <laughs> and to produce hydrogen in order to win the fight and uh, win which which fight? Would it work? <laughs> Doesn't. The the fight we are delivering for uh, our kids because all the uh, all the CO2 emissions we are doing right now will have a CO2 effect, a greenhouse gas effect, a greenhouse effect for uh, at least uh, one century. So if we cut all emissions right now, we won't see. You and I, an effect. It's the kids that we have and the kids of our kids that will benefit from our action. So if we want them to have a bright future like I had in the 90s, uh, playing uh, Nintendo and uh, eating chocolates and, uh, and playing in the, in, the, in the square, doing bike, well, we need to act right now. The, the good news is that women and men are geniuses. We invented everything, everything we need. We have biogas, we have smart grids, we have batteries, we have everything, renewables, and we need to invest massively in all this and not a slow investment like it was mentioned before, a fast, quick and deep investment in all this everywhere. And we need all this. We don't need only hydrogen. We don't need only batteries. Batteries, they won't be able to decarbonize everything. Electricity cannot decarbonize everything. Hydrogen cannot decarbonize everything. But all the pieces of the puzzle are here. That's such a great news. We can do it. And what, what we do at LIFE is that we are producers of sustainable hydrogen. So this hydrogen that we produce can supply the fuel because hydrogen is a new fuel, to heavy duty vehicles, to buses, to trucks, to SUVs, to trains, that are quite difficult to decarbonize with batteries. Because if you have a truck with batteries, you're pulling more batteries than, uh, than goods. So it doesn't work. So hydrogen is a good solution for those trucks, for those SUVs, if you need to go from Paris to Madrid for holidays, you, can do that. you cannot do that with batteries. You need to have an hydrogen car if you want to be at zero CO2 emission by 2050. And also, it's a good solution for industry. Hydrogen is used as a chemical compound in many industries. So electricity cannot replace Hydrogen, we need to produce hydrogen from renewables in order to have green, sustainable, ecological hydrogen instead of the fossil hydrogen that is used currently in the chemical industry, for example. And a good solution also for the steel industry. We will need steel. We need steel for cars, for the buildings, for the forks, for the chairs, etc. Et Good solution that is already in place in the Middle East in Japan is using hydrogen to produce steel. So it's a solution that is now, Jan, look at me, <laughs> happening. <laughs> and this is right now. Here you see our first plant, and we have 66 of those under 
financing all over Europe. It's a plant that produces hydrogen from the windmills that you see there. And we store the hydrogen in these containers that you see. So we fill with the factory the containers with hydrogen, and we deliver the containers to the refueling station that fill the buses or to the steel industry, to the chemical industry. And what, what we need is water, because we extract hydrogen from water. Here, we are using sea water. But in some projects that we have, we are using um, water from the landfill. We are using water from rivers, rain water, etc. So we use water, and we extract hydrogen from water. And when we do that, the only byproduct that we have is oxygen. And we are actually more an oxygen producer than an hydrogen producer. Because each time we produce one kilogram of hydrogen, we produce eight kilograms of oxygen. And this is really important. The, the site you've seen before can supply with hydrogen a small city. On the site you see here, where we are going to install 124 megawatt of electrolysis, the biggest electrolysis site in the world. This is in Denmark. We have 30 million from the European Commission to build that. We kicked the project off two weeks ago. On this site, we will have 124 megawatts. This is enough to supply hydrogen to all the buses of London. There's 8,000 buses in London. We can supply hydrogen for all the buses and garbage trucks, refuse trucks of Paris. Just one site, one site like this. And of course, if we want to replace oil, you know, the quantity of energy that we are using in the form of natural gas or oil is just tremendous. It's, it's really huge. You cannot picture how huge it is compared to the electricity. You and I, globally, in our energy mix, we use 25% of electricity, and all the rest, mostly it's gas and oil. So if we want to replace a good share of oil with hydrogen, we need to produce hydrogen in huge quantities. Where is the best source of energy? Where is the most available source of energy? It's on the ocean. On the ocean. In Europe, the uh, resource that we have, offshore wind, the offshore wind resource that we have, is 11, 11 times the electrical, electrical consumption that we currently have. 11 times. Globally in the, in, in the world, it's 18 times. So it's just huge. And now picture out something. I mentioned that we are more producing oxygen than hydrogen. Imagine that in the future, we value the oxygen and put oxygen back in the ocean to repair what we've been doing in the, in the past decades. We will give back the ocean its ability to absorb CO2, because when you put back oxygen in the ocean, you give the ability to life to grow again. And this is validated by the digital model of the IPCC that we run currently in Brest at Ifremer. The IPCC model, digital model, they are done by the French, by Ifremer, and that's what we are currently uh, validating. And this is happening. This is already in place. Next summer, we will have hydrogen produced there, thanks to this windmill. And this future is possible. We are currently making it possible. And I won't stop. I won't stop until this happens. This is the concept that we have with floating windmills. We have concept of offshore production with boats, large boats that we turn into hydrogen production plant offshore. We have concepts with rigs that used to drill well, but we turn those rigs into hydrogen production platform. All the concepts are feasible. It's doable. We are doing it. And at life, 
we won't stop uh, until we become a green unicorn. A green unicorn is a, a company that has the ability to save one billion ton of CO2. We don't care about being valued at one billion euro. We want to be valued at one billion ton of CO2 avoided, and I won't stop until then. Thank you. Bonsoir. Vous m'entendez? Can you hear me okay? I'm not going to talk in English, I'm going to talk in French. I hope uh, it's not a problem for you. Uh, and you'll see very quickly the link between the previous presentation and uh, what I'm going to, uh, to, to tell you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Catherine Brun. Uh, I'm uh, secrétaire générale in. Uh, I'm general secretary uh, of a company called Gertegas, who is the, the main transporter of gas in, and gas in France. And I am uh, very happy to represent my company. Gertegas is very happy today to, to be able to present you the project Mosaic, how it describes itself uh, in the dynamics of the carbonation of the territories by the development of the uh, renewable hydrogen, uh, the low carbon hydrogen. This, this presentation will be made by three voices, two of which will be digital, as uh, I will be accompanied by a uh, presentation by Claude Siver, who is the CEO of NCEVO, that will present you later, and another presentation of Mr. Jean Montner, who is the uh, president of the region Grand Est. Uh, in, before getting into the details of the project, I would like to underline uh, the importance for Gertegas to participate to this COP26. As the, five years ago, during the COP21, we took some engagements, very strong engage, engagements, to, to develop uh, the uh, sector of uh, hyd renewable hydrogen, as we've signed with our partners a decision to, to build a demonstrator of production and uh, of uh, renewable uh, uh, hydrogen in the south of France, and for us to be present uh, here today, it allows us to show how we've advanced, how we moved on since, and allows us to, uh, to emphasize the, our determination, our, our uh, engagement for the neutral uh, carbon neutrality. Let's get back to the mosaic. What is it, what is it about? Okay. Mosaic uh, aims at uh, implementing a hydrogen ecosystem, transborder one, because it's between three uh, countries, France, Germany, and Luxembourg. So it's a transborder, cross-border uh, system, uh, as we are going to uh, do production and the consumption, but through the transport. So this is the, the, the strength of this value chain. Concretely, somebody, somebody is trying to destabilize me. What, what is it about? It will be about uh, to convert 70 kilometers of uh, tubes, pipelines, uh, gas pipelines, to convert them uh, to hydrogen and to build 30 kilometers of a, of a new uh, hydrogen duke pipelines, in other words, in the three countries that I've mentioned before. And this infrastructure, transport infrastructure, will allow to connect a whole, eco, uh, whole system of production of low carbon hydrogen uh, through the conversion of an old, uh, old uh, coal uh, electricity production plant uh, into uh, a new industry like in Tagito in Germany uh, while maintaining a new means of sustainable uh, mobility, and we're talking about heavy things, we'll develop uh, river 
uh, mobility, also train mobility and road uh, mobility. Mosaic, as you can see, is a part of a dynamics of a project much larger than a, a simple infrastructural project of uh, pipelines with different actors, uh, institutional and private ones, who uh, worked together since um, last October, who, and they built a uh, 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 European group of uh, economic interests called uh, Big Hydrogen. I will pass the floor uh, to Claude Sever. He's from uh, Ensevo, he's an operator of gas and uh, fuel from Luxembourg, who's uh, the creator of uh, the hydrogen project. participer à cet événement via vidéo et ainsi témoigner de l'engagement du groupe NCVO dans l'initiative Grande Région Hydrogène et en plus particulièrement dans le projet Mosaïque. L'initiative Grande Région Hydrogène, comme l'indique son nom, tourne autour de l'hydrogène et, et veut contribuer à la décarbonation de notre région, c'est-à-dire de la Sarre, de la Lorraine et du Luxembourg. Cet aspect régional est très important parce qu'effectivement, cette région a une longue histoire ensemble. On a beaucoup d'industries, on a beaucoup d'échanges transfrontaliers, on a des infrastructures existantes qui nous connectent. C'est bien sur cet héritage, sur ces infrastructures que se greffe le projet Mosaïque, qui n'est rien d'autre qu'une reconversion d'anciens gazoducs qui ne sont plus utilisés aujourd'hui vers l'hydrogène. Autour de ce projet, on essaye de fédérer des partenaires locaux, des acteurs majeurs de l'industrie et de la mobilité, en fait de toute la chaîne, la valeur de l'hydrogène, de la production à la, à la consommation. Et c'est ensemble qu'on veut avancer dans la transition énergétique dans la région, car c'est ensemble qu'il faut construire le nouveau système énergétique qui correspond à nos besoins spécifiques et qui se bâti sur nos atouts d'aujourd'hui. Un deuxième aspect clé, à côté de la régionalité, c'est euh, l'aspect international de cette initiative. Effectivement, bon, la crise climatique, elle est planétaire, c'est les différentes nations qui se fixent des, des objectifs, mais c'est bien en local, en régional, que des actions concrètes doivent se faire, et là, elles ne doivent pas s'arrêter à la frontière. Et donc ici, dans, dans cette initiative, on a des partenaires de la France, de l'Allemagne, du Luxembourg, qui travaillent ensemble. En effet, notre région est bien un microcosme transfrontalier, une économie, trans, une économie trans, transnationale. Hein. Et, et ainsi, l'initiative se fait aussi un peu un mini-laboratoire, un nucléus pour un système plus large européen, in, in fine. Hein. C'est ensemble avec GRT Gaz qu'on a lancé cette initiative. Aujourd'hui, on est à huit partenaires qui chacun a son propre projet et qui le fait développer. Mais ça, on est échange étroit avec les autres partenaires. Et c'est bien ça ce qui nous tient ensemble, parce que tous les partenaires partagent la même vision, la même approche, une approche par cluster régional, mais sans barrière nationale. Merci. Je peux avoir le slide suivant, s'il vous plaît. Next slide, please. All right. So, thank you, Claude. Uh, what we should know 
as well is that mosaic is just a first step towards making tangible a true hydrogen infrastructure, the European hydrogen backbone, uh, which aim is to favor the uh, appearance of a hydrogen economy to allow for the decarbon decarbonation of the energy industry, both in France uh, and in Germany, and in the rest of Europe, by the way. As you see here, Mosaic is just a first chapter of a longer story. Uh, the first step of this initiative, but behind that, there is a whole study that has been led by our peers uh, from the European transport industry coming up with a modelization of the needs in terms of decarbonation for the energy grids in Europe, identifying why and how the, um, the gas pipes that we are, the, the gas pipeline that we have to empty, uh, and how these pipes could be reused in order to help us and become a part of this hydrogen uh, infrastructure connecting and balancing uh, production and consumption, hydrogen production and consumption, potentially together with the development of this hydrogen to, if necessary, uh, bring up quantities uh, of hydrogen from other countries, from North, um, North Africa, for example, in order to, uh, to fulfill and, and that's why this is the vision, the broader vision of Mosaic, and this is just a first step. And as we're saying, Claude, the cooperation of different playmakers within this project and later for the hydrogen backbone is something uh, extremely important in order to develop even a innovation and new uh, value pathways, but also to be in the capacity to stimulate an institutional dy dynamic that is necess necessary with the emergence of this new vector that is hydrogen. And this is why uh, I would give the floor now to Jean Rotner, who is the uh, president of uh, Eastern France, the great Eastern France region, and from an international region as well, Saar, Eastern France and Luxembourg for him to showcase his vision of our hydrogen future and the necessary cooperation between neighbors uh, in a transborder way, uh, which playmakers, which stakeholders are facing the same, the same issues. So Jean, uh, if you would, thank you. Monsieur le Ministre, Mesdames, Messieurs, si la région Grand Est s'associe aujourd'hui à la COP26 de Glasgow, c'est parce que je suis convaincu que ce sont les territoires qui ont entre leurs mains les clés de la transition énergétique et environnementale. Les régions soutiennent et impulsent au quotidien des dynamiques, des projets en matière de biodiversité, d'eau, d'énergie renouvelable. C'est au quotidien que nous agissons en proximité pour prendre maintenant le virage des transitions réussies. Cela fait bientôt trois ans que le Grand Est a décidé de miser sur une énergie d'avenir, l'hydrogène. Une stratégie régionale ambitieuse a été adoptée afin de faire de notre région, qui se situe, vous le savez, au cœur de l'Europe, une véritable vallée hydrogène. Nous avons pour cela trois grandes priorités. Nous misons d'abord sur la production d'hydrogène verte et décarbonée comme source d'énergie renouvelable. Ensuite, nous voulons stimuler l'usage de l'hydrogène verte dans l'industrie. Enfin, nous faisons le pari de développer des flottes lourdes, hydrogènes, comme les péniches, les bus, les ménordures, mais aussi les trams. Et la région Grand Est fait ainsi partie de ces régions françaises qui ont fait le pari du train H2. Nous voulons clairement agir sur toute la chaîne de valeur de cette filière d'innovation et d'avenir. Un écosystème est ainsi né de cet engagement régional. 
et réunit des acteurs innovants, des acteurs qui ont envie de changer nos modes de déplacement, mais aussi de production et de distribution d'énergie. C'est le club Dynamisme. Je suis fier que notre région accueille des projets originaux et structurants qui font de l'hydrogène une pièce essentielle du buzz de la transition énergétique. Et le projet Mosaïque, porté par GRT Gaz, Créos et Ocevos, est pour moi crucial tant il illustre ce dynamisme et cette originalité de notre territoire. Oui, nous faisons le choix de soutenir le transport et la distribution d'hydrogène car c'est essentiel aujourd'hui et cela sera encore plus essentiel demain. La COP26 nous montre bien qu'il nous faut collectivement mettre tout en œuvre pour réduire, limiter, remplacer les énergies fossiles. Pour cela, il faut aussi pouvoir transporter et distribuer les énergies. Le projet Mosaïque est le premier projet de canalisation hydrogène transfrontalier d'Europe. Je vous pose une seule question. Comment ne pas être aux côtés de ces acteurs privés qui posent là les fondations de l'Europe du Green Deal Comment ne pas être en soutien d'un projet transfrontalier unique en Europe Si vous ne le savez pas, je suis un Européen convaincu. Ce type de projet, c'est la preuve d'une Europe du quotidien. C'est la preuve d'une Europe de l'innovation. C'est la preuve d'une Europe de l'avenir. J'y crois profondément. Je crois profondément à cette Europe visionnaire, innovante et proche des territoires. Nous en sommes collectivement les chevilles ouvrières. Et puis, excusez-moi, c'est quand même tout un symbole. Partir de la production d'hydrogène verte sur un, un territoire en reconversion, une centrale à charbon pour fournir l'industrie lourde allemande de l'autre côté de la frontière, c'est quelque chose, je crois, d'exemplaire et d'historique. De quoi éclairer les débats des dirigeants des pays membres de la COP sur la problématique des centrales en charbon. En tout cas, j'en suis persuadé. Nous pouvons décarboner, nous en faisons la preuve en grand test parce que nous l'avons décidé. L'hydrogène peut et doit devenir la filière d'excellence de la France. Alors, je vous pose la dernière question. Est-ce qu'ensemble, nous avons la force de relever ce défi Moi, je réponds présent. Inspirant. Hein Inspiring, isn't it? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Mathieu, for these two presentations, very concrete of projects. Yes, uh, it is inspiring, and we think there's, there's many uh, challenges ahead. But uh, thank you all for your presence here, and I wish you a very good end of the evening and of the afternoon. Thank you.